This is Jocko Podcast number 270 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. I'd made a mistake that was going to cost me my life. I turned to the man beside me. He was a Yemeni. We called him H, and he was the only passenger in the beat-up local car I was driving. The air around us was, was stiff with heat and tension. The vehicle almost rocking as the press of humanity outside began to shove towards me, pointing. I kept my eyes down, not out of fear, but so that they didn't get a good look at them through the dirty glass. I knew exactly what had happened, how they'd spotted me. I was dressed head to toe as a local, from flip-flops to a turban. I had a dyed beard and my skin colored, but what I hadn't added to my disguise was my brown contact lenses, and now my bright blue eyes were drawing the locals in to point and stare. I knew it was only a matter of minutes before the neighborhood bad guys started slipping out of their hiding places, and tonight I could look forward to an orange jumpsuit. The last thing the world would see of me was the image of a former special forces soldier about to meet his end, courtesy of an enemy unfamiliar with the Geneva Convention. Bullocks. I wanted to talk to H. I wanted to the local man's opinion. But if the people outside saw my lips moving in a funny way, then we were truly fucked. And so instead, I raised an eyebrow and hoped that people would just think I was commenting on the traffic that had packed us into this bustling marketplace. H gave a shrug in reply, as if to say, what can you do? What could I do? Get my head chopped off or go out fighting. Those seemed to be the choices. I knew which one I'd choose if it came down to it, but I couldn't help but hear the voice in the back of my head, the voice that had told me always, You'll never last two minutes in the army. Well, if this was the end, I'd show them how wrong they were. I'd been showing them for years. This wasn't my first covert mission as a civilian. I'd cut my teeth as a special forces soldier, and as such, I'd had my medal tested again and again. I tried to remember that as yet another local pointed at me and began waving towards my door. I pretended to be busy looking ahead at traffic and checked the mirror behind me. No sign of our second car. I wanted to rub my eyes. Despite the danger, I was knackered. Maybe that's why I had made the mistake. Maybe that was why I had to get on my radio, hidden away, out of sight from the Yemenis who continued to walk by peering in and pointing at me. I kept my message short, trying to move my lips as little as possible. I've been compromised. My mate Sam came on the net from the second vehicle. He was out of sight, but I was sure that he couldn't be more than 100 meters away. Are you compromised? Over? He asked. I confirmed that I was. Are you happy with the immediate action drill? Over? I knew that drill off by heart. The first part would involve me pulling a snub-nosed machine gun from beneath my seat and emptying a full magazine into the windscreen. This would send a very loud signal that it was a good idea for people to get away from me. It would buy me seconds to grab my wrapped-up assault rifle, wedge between the seat and the door, and exit the vehicle. Then me and my flip-flops would be racing for the nearest safe house. Sam came back on the net. Your call, out. My call. When it comes down to it, the biggest moments in your life always are. I thought about letting out a deep breath, but looking ice cool in front of H was important to me. Fear is contagious, and so I put mine on a shelf until I got clear of the situation. Instead, I imagined everything that was about to happen in this shitstorm. Bloody hell, I almost laughed to myself. All this over a pair of contact lenses. I looked at H, gave him the slightest of nods. He was probably sending up a prayer at that point. Maybe more than one. 
My own thoughts went to my wife and children. If someone wanted to stop me seeing them again, then I promised it would be a fight like no other. And then, with the thought of my family pumping like fire through my veins, I reached below my seat and took hold of my weapon. And that is the opening of a book. The book is called Relentless and is written by someone named Dean Stott, who is a British soldier who served as an engineer in the commandos and eventually went on to the British Special Forces selection and became one of the first army soldiers to opt into joining the Special Boat Service, the counterpart to the British SAS. And that is just the beginning of this story. And luckily for us, Dean is here himself to help talk us through his experiences in the military and beyond. Dean, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming aboard. No, pleasure to have me. It's been a long time that we have been getting requests to have a Brit on here. So you're the you're the first. Well, we had we had one photographer who had had been to Iraq, but I think you're our first British military person. And there's been a lot of requests. Oh, brilliant! Great. So. Glad, glad to have you here, man. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the whole the whole nation is is riding on on your shoulders. So, um, that's the that's the beginning of this book, and the beginning of the book starts off it's sort of the middle of your your operational career when you talk about the military operations and then civilian operations. But I guess we should start at the beginning. I always like to start at the beginning of you know where you came from and and how you ended up in this particular situation <laughs> in life and um yeah let's get to it yeah so i was um i was born into a military family my father he was in the royal engineers and um so i was very much immersed in that in that environment and i grew up in a town called oldershot which was the home of the british army so it's just airborne heavy you had <laughs> two para there, you had three para there. I'd never even heard of the Royal Marines or the Special Boat Service. You know what I mean, it was just <laughs> SAS and, and Airborne. Um, my father and my mother, they, they ended up splitting up when I was quite a young age. Um, by the age of eight, mm-hmm. my mother um, left my father and took me and my sisters to Manchester up north. Mm-hmm. And we ended up in a homeless home in Moss Side. And Moss Side back in the 80s was the roughest estate in the whole of the UK. Now, I, now when Brits say estate, yeah. When see when Americans say a state, they're thinking of like a country <laughs> estate with right. big houses. When Brits say a state, you're yeah. talking about the ghetto. Yes, it's a, and, it's a ghetto. Yeah, and it's it's a government housing, right? Is that what? Is it, isn't it a government housing estate? That's where the word estate comes from. Yeah, they call them council estates, and yeah, but obviously to get your your name on on the housing market, you have to then go into a homeless home. So that's what we did. We ended up in a homeless shelter in Moss Side and you know I was the only white me and my sisters the only Caucasians in in the area so we were attracting attention from an early start the you know this soon ended up with me learning how to fight with my fists quite early you know protecting my sisters in in, in, in the school playground actually I ended up having to leave that school because too many fighting and we moved to another another place within Manchester my mother we then got housing my father however used to travel up Mm-hmm. And pick us up every other weekend. It's about a 240 mile drive one way uh, and take us back down. Me and my father are very close. My sister was very close to my, to my mother. And three years later, my father got custody, you know, of, of me and my sisters. Um, wow, the, that's that is that hard? I mean, America, it's pretty hard for a, especially a military dude to get custody yeah. over the mom. Yeah, no, there, there was. I think obviously, you know, he, he, put his career on pause. He, he got promoted to regimental Sergeant major and was posted to Germany. And he said, no, I'll, I want to stay in the UK. I want, I want to look after my kids. And so he put his whole career online. And I think the judge at the time um, didn't want the siblings splitting up. Mm-hmm. You know, he didn't want like two sisters being in Manchester and the son down south. So the judge said, no, the children make the decision. And, and being the eldest at the age of about 10 and a half, I had to make that quite hard decision and so no I want to live live with my father and he he got custody and I and you know even to the day I, I remember the day that my mum dropped us off and the reaction she saw when my father took us away you know that sticks with you something something like that 
But for me, we moved back down to Aldershot and, you know, I'm very close to my father. I, I never actually wanted to pursue a career in the military myself. I actually always wanted to be a fireman. Um, but we, we, we grew up around there. But my dad is, he was, he was a Scotsman. Mm-hmm. He was old school Sergeant Major. He was old school uh, through and through. And I remember finishing like junior school and we went on to what you call high school, so like mm-hmm. secondary school. And so this is what age? What age is this? Well, I would have been about 13 at this age. So at 13, you're, you've been living with your dad for a few years now. A couple of years. And yeah. you're seeing the military, but you're still not quite, you're not quite, um, it, like enthralled by it yeah yeah no I, I, as i say when i was immersed the, our school playground uh was where the red devils used to take off which is the um the british parachute and free fall team so every day you, you'd see the parachutes the guys would be walking around in their their uniforms in their maroon berets and it was just it was almost like the the norm mm-hmm. living in older shots so um but my father was new, now going to transition out of the military. My father, his career wasn't very, um, he was more sports. He was what we would call a tracksuit soldier. Mm-hmm. He was very good at a sport and, and soccer was his. So he was the army manager, coach and player. So I very rarely saw my father in green kit. You know, it was more tracksuit trainers and, and on, <laughs> on the football pitch. So I didn't really know much about the military and, and, and the layout of the military. And um, was, he, was he going on deployments? Uh, he he went on deployments to like Northern Ireland, um, mm-hmm. but that was. But when he then got custody of the kids, you know that obviously stopped him going on on any deployments. And this was a period of time actually, you know, the last conflict was 1982, which was was the Falklands. Mm-hmm. So there was, there was a, a dry period up until now. We had the Gulf War in '91, um, but that was still to come. Actually, that was two years two years later. So other than Northern Ireland, there wasn't really any sort of overseas deployments. So it didn't didn't really affect him going away. Um, but he was now coming to the end of his career mm-hmm. and transitioning to Civvy Street. So growing up in Aldershot in these military schools, um, he then decided to put me in secondary school in the, in the local town. It's called North Camp. Um, but being old school, my, 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 my father dressed me up day one in a blazer carrying like a, a briefcase, a leather <laughs> briefcase. You know, it wasn't even real leather. That's what I was more upset about. Um, but my hair was, was, was a crew cut, you know, Rather than going downtown and paying for a normal haircut, my mm. father would take me to camp and just put me in straight at the front of the queue with all the recruits. <laughs> um, That's legit. Yeah, so I really stood out. When I turned up at school day one, I, I stood out. And Wait, so is this school, what, what kind of, is this school like a, what we call in America a private school where you have to pay to go to or what was different? No, it was a public school, but it wasn't in a military town. It was next oh, to the military okay. town. So the, the children that went there, their parents weren't from the military. Because it was so close to Aldershot, there was a lot of rivalry between. And so the haircut, just, just, I just stood out. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, unfortunately, a week later, I, I got suspended from that school for fighting. And <laughs> <laughs> like, were you just an angry youth or what? No, I just think I was just put in some really awkward positions uh, and, and that, that being one. But I always remember my father, I know you guys do Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You know, mm. My father, again, always taught me to fight with my fists. And mm. as soon as the guy was down... We call down, that Scottish jiu-jitsu. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but as soon as the opponent's down, that's it. You, mm. you, you, you know, you stop. You've got the better of them. And um, there's no like follow-up like there is nowadays. Mm. So I, I, I was so nervous when I got home and, and I, I sort of left the left a letter on the table and quickly ran upstairs to the toilet. And my father, could, you know, screams out my name. And um, I come down and his, his, his one question was, did you, did you hit him when he was down? I said, no, he said, that's fine. And then I had to, I then explained to him, I said, look, you dressed me in this, this. And he, he just thought he was doing good by me. <laughs> when in fact, he was bringing too, far too much attention. <laughs> um, we then left actually not long, a few months after that and moved out into the country. Um, totally away from any sort of military town. And, and that was almost the start for me. That was the start of a new life. You know, I'd left that military background behind me. Um, so how old are you now? I'm probably about 14 now. Right on. And and then you get to, where, what, where, where, where'd you move to when you got this new start? So I moved to, uh, into Surrey. So it's just south of London. Mm-hmm. But it's um, more, uh, very, very green. Um, you know, the country. country. The country, exactly. <laughs> and now did you... Uh, how was that? Was that like, uh, you said it was a new start. 
because you were able to fit in a little bit better? Your dad didn't shave your head to send you to school? <laughs> yeah, exactly. There was no military barbers, but it was also that no one could judge you. You, you sort of left your, your past behind you, you know, Manchester fighting. And, um, you know, it's almost like this is the baseline. You, you start from now. So, um, and again, it was actually nice to um, socialize with kids whose parents weren't in. It's learning stuff that was out of that military lifestyle. You know, all my friends back in Oldershot, their dads were all airborne because my dad wasn't. They called him a hat. Uh. You know what I mean? It was just like you didn't have any of that. I didn't have to prove anything to them or, or feel like, you know, because you know, your father's career, you're, you're part of that. And, that. and that's what Oldershot was like. It was like, Ooh. oh, what, what ranks your father? Is, is he para or is he not? And it's like, oh, God. I had a friend who was, uh, who was Australian, SAS, and... He was saying, uh, he, he, you know, him and his wife, we were talking and he was like, they're, they have an expression. It was like, oh, their wife wears the rank of the family. So it's like, oh, we, you know, he's Lieutenant Colonel. Who are you? Yeah. It sounds like, but I can't imagine little kids telling me my dad's not <laughs> airborne. <laughs> oh yeah. That's really great. Why do they call him a hat? Uh, it's just saying that the parachute regiment call him hat. I, I don't know where, I, we say heli airborne troop, but it's, it's not. They just call him a hat because they, they don't have the maroon berry and then you know some of the army commandos also take on that terminology and call them call them hats or, or screamers we in the army the american army they call someone that's not airborne a leg <laughs> and it's said <laughs> with such disdain i remember when i went to airborne schools i come here you nasty leg <laughs> <laughs> and then in the the in the navy the 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 aviation guys People that are in, in helicopters or jets or whatever planes, they wear brown shoes. It's part of their uniforms. Yeah. So they call, in a derogatory way, they call anybody that's not a brown shoe, which no one uses that term, but they call everyone else a black shoe. <laughs> and so then in the teams, we take that one step further and like the derogatory, who's that guy? Some shoe came over and told us <laughs> if we couldn't wear that, whatever. So that's uh, it's funny how you get these little 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 words that stick, yeah. but hat. Yeah, hat hat is the parachute regiment, and then the Marines, obviously from the army, it's Pongo. <laughs> no, no. The and army you, go, the you had little kids telling you your dad's a hat. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, and again, no <laughs> wonder you had to fight on a regular basis. <laughs> yeah, if it was airborne, I'd probably been all right. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so 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 you end up in in Surrey. Yeah, you're in the country. Do you feel like your life's taken a better direction? So your dad was a good, great athlete, apparently. Mm. Well, did you inherit that athleticism and love for the game? I did, yeah. I think that's where, you know, I'm very competitive. I, li I like to compete, and I, I think that's, you know, from my father. You know, even to the, on Christmas Day with the board game, it got that competitive. Mm. Um, you, you had to win, you know. And, um, you know, so I did inherit that, that from him. Um, Sport wise, I and I, I followed in his footsteps. You know, played uh, played football as well. I, I wasn't great at sport, but I just tried everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I was very fortunate at school. I ended up getting sports personality of the year award, which sounds amazing. That does but sound I, pretty but, amazing. Yeah, but I wasn't the best at football. I wasn't the best at rugby. You know, I just helped out. You know, if they said right, we need someone on the basketball team. Well, I don't really know basketball, but but I would step in. So so I sort of I had that from my father. But um, and I think that's what helped later on in the military career mm -hmm. you know i always found myself competing with others or having to prove prove a point or be an ambassador mm -hmm. well that's two different things actually mm. prove a point or be an ambassador yeah i don't know how that's that's like that's two different things right if i'm trying yeah. to prove a point that's one thing if i'm trying to be in it's like one's going to come at you yeah. the ambassador is going to be cool so you found that nice like middle ground between those two things yeah well I, f I found myself that you know when you're in the army and you you are working alongside marines you're an ambassador for your cat badge God. if that makes sense you know what yeah. i mean and then when you go to the sbs from the army you're an ambassador for the for the british army mm -hmm. when you're on jocko's podcast and you're the first <laughs> british guy you're an ambassador <laughs> of the british army right? it's, it's, so, so i was proving a point to myself and to them but almost representing mm -hmm. your, your unit or your cat batch so you talked about you wanted to be a fireman and in the book you in the book you it sounds like at some point you realize there's a lot of applicants to be a fireman and like thousands of applicants to be a fireman. It's sort of like in America, we get a similar thing here, but yeah. you realized it's probably not gonna happen? Yeah, well, back to the schooling, my father, again, being old school, he wouldn't let me go out and play unless I did my homework, so he, he would check everything. So in school-wise, I, I did quite well. I didn't look 
beyond school. I didn't look at college. I thought I was just going to join the fire brigade. And you had to be 18 anyway, so I was still underage. And, and at the time, there was a big recession. And there was 2,000 applicants for, for one job. I, I went to college. Um, but every summer holidays as a young kid, my father would take me and my sisters down to the southwest of England to, uh, to Cornwall. And we would go surfing. Mm-hmm. So I've been surfing since you know a young boy. So uh, during college, we had a two-week summer holiday. So me and my mates were like, right, let's go down to Newquay. None of them surfed, but they just wanted to try and find gills. So we, you know, we all went down to Newquay um, for two weeks. Um, I was in the water all day, and they're just, just sat on the beach uh, doing their thing. And um, I met a Norwegian guy called Jan. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, we just got chatting, and he was a silver surface waiter. Uh, at the local hotel so Fistral Beach is actually on the, the surf tour uh, the pro surf tour and Fistral Beach Hotel is on, on the peninsula and he said well I'm getting 30 pounds a day I, I, I serve breakfast I get free breakfast I serve I surf all day and then in the evening I serve the evening meal and you know I get a free meal I get 30 pound in my pocket it's only 10 pound for the hostel <laughs> I thought, brilliant, you know, being an entrepreneur, I thought, I'll, I'll have a piece of that. <laughs> so two weeks later, my father came to pick us up. And this is now, what well, are you talking, 94, long before any mobile phones and things like that. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't in the car park with my friends. And my, my dad's like, well, where's Dean? And they said, oh, he's staying. So, my, oh, so your friends met your dad? Yeah, my dad dropped us off and he, he came back to pick us up two weeks later, but I wasn't there. Um, yeah, so uh, again, I just didn't want to confront my dad uh, and I didn't want to go back to college. So I just didn't want to get into an argument. So when you got done with what we call high school, how old are you? So we're about 16. Okay, so then your college yeah. starts after that and this is taking place during this two week break. You yeah. go down there, you're surfing, you're, yeah. you're living the dream. And you see this Norwegian cat that's got it all figured out. <laughs> <laughs> and you figured you're in. Yeah, that's it. That's my life all planned out now, the roadmap. Um, <laughs> but, but my father then came back six months later, you know, looking for me. Uh, and he found me working in a, a local surf shop. And he's, you know, like, right, you know, you've messed up your education. That's it. Your life is over. You know, giving it all, all these all these little one-liners. So for me to really just silence him, I just said, well, I'll, I'll join the army. And you normally expect some you know, warm, comforting words from your father, but I was sort of met with a response, you'd last two minutes. Um, probably wasn't the response I wanted, but I thought, okay, you know, there's no point in getting into an argument. The best thing to do is try and prove him wrong. But I was about five foot seven and 65 kilos, so I could probably <laughs> see where he was coming from at, at, at the time. But he drove me back down to Surrey, and then the, the following Monday, you know, we went, I went into the careers office. Did your dad go with you? No, he didn't. But his office was only 400 meters from there. So I, I walked in and it was in older shot, obviously para heavy, airborne. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I came out and uh, went to my dad's office and said, I'm, I'm joining the parachute regiment. He <laughs> says, you're bloody not. And marched me straight back in. Um, I didn't, obviously he was Royal Engineers. I didn't know much about the Royal Engineers. I didn't know that you actually can do P Company and be an airborne engineer or do the All Arms Commander course and be a commando engineer. All I'd known was him playing football. So when he actually explained a bit more to me, I thought, okay, that, that's a good idea. And he wanted you to go engineer so you'd have some kind of a civilian skill set, that's whether it. it was building or pouring concrete or whatever yeah. skill you're going to get. Yeah, he was thinking, obviously, sh- short term, I'll probably do minimum three years, you know, be a bricklayer, a plumber. So, but also... Within the military, there was A trades and B trades. Your B trades in the engineers were your artisan trades, which is like carpenter, plumber, you know, everything else. And then your A trades was like your electricians and uh, plant operators, so the big JCBs and, mm-hmm. and diggers. So my dad said, what about a plant fitter? Um, so I was like, oh, gardener. I didn't even know what he was on about. He said, no, he then explained. But again, before that, once, once he'd marched me back in the office, a week later, I had to go in and do this touchscreen test. And basically, I passed it. And they said, you can choose any trade you want. Obviously, back in 94, I was thinking more with my, my penis. And <laughs> I was thinking, bomb disposal. That sounds sexy. I said, let's go bomb disposal. So I went to my dad's office. I said, I'm going bomb disposal. He said, you're not. And he just marched me straight back in. And then he said, right, why don't you be a plant fear? And again, you know, he was... He was sort of carving my path or put me in the right direction, mm-hmm. you know, if I stepped off. And that's it. So then, so then you're enlisted. And how long was the, was the wait between when you enlisted 
and when you actually shipped off to basic training? It wasn't long at all. It was about two, two to three months. Um, I went to a place called Purbright. You you have like a, um, it's almost like an acquaint, you know, three days there. You do all your, your fitness tests and then you speak to other recruits, you know, get their perception on, on, on basic training. So I was actually, I think my dad pulled a few few strings because I seemed to get uh, get quite quick <laughs> to the start point than others. And then uh, in the book you say, you basically say that basic training is what basic training is. What, is there anything that shocked you about it? Or did you feel like you were pretty ready for it? Um, again, my, my father, you know, he's starting to steer and things. I, I had to turn up. Uh, it's a place called Bazinborn, and all I'd known about Bazinborn is where they filmed Full Metal Jacket and Memphis Bell, and, and that's the only research I'd done on the, on this place. Um, but you had to be there um, from zero eight hundred in the morning to seventeen hundred at night. You had to pray on the, on the Sunday actually between those times. My father had me dropped off at zero seven fifty five with my hair already cut and my bag already packed because he knew it was all about first impressions. Mm-hmm. You know, if you start coming in, you know, just over five or about half four, <laughs> you know what I mean? The, 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 the instructors were already marked your cards. But I, I, had, I arrived at five to eight and I, I stood there from eight o'clock till five o'clock in the, in the, in the evening. So, <laughs> you know, in reflection going back, I know why, why he did it yeah. at, at the time. It was raining. I didn't appreciate it. But, you know, it's a culture shock. Uh, training everything you're you're sort of used to having your your home comforts is it, taken away from you guys who did have hair soon lost their hair and we all look the same um but it's good uh, you know it still instills that discipline from from the off um, how, how long is british army boot camp so it depends what what cat bad so for the royal engineers we do um 10 weeks basic training and and literally that just is as what it says it's basic training we then have phase two combat engineer training which is about 14 weeks Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you go on if you then want to go do the commando course the commando course is is 10 weeks as well so if you start putting them all together it can be quite long if you join the royal marines that's nine months from from start to finish um so yeah it all depends on on what cat badge you're going to but originally basic training is about 10 weeks and then you got picked up to become when did you get picked up to become a physical training instructor yeah so it I, seems like they had a lot of faith in you out of the gate or was that your dad working behind the scenes no <laughs> well, I, well what it was when i when i finished uh, my phase two training um I, I got my post in order and i remember ringing my my, my dad and my stepmom uh, penny and i said yeah i've got posted to 2a and then she starts crying on the phone and my dad's my dad picks up the phone and said, what have you said to Penny? I said, I've been posted to 2-8. And I can hear him in the background. He said, 2-8, not Q-8, <laughs> like that. But what it was, because my father was the army manager, 2-8 engineer regiments were in Germany with the army champions, football champions in Germany. So it was like, you're Stott's son. So you're coming out to Germany. So I, I got posted to Hamel uh, at the age of 18, um, which at the time was good. You know, it was, it was the Deutschmark before the Euro. It was like, it must cost about $7 for a crate of Bex at 24. You know, it, you know I, was, I, was, I was seeing Germany, which which is now collapsed now. Mm-hmm. Everyone's back in UK. But... As soon as I arrived, my sergeant major knew that they call us kiss ballers, the footballers. You're a kiss baller. Mm-hmm. He goes, I'm not going to see you. Because literally, it was almost semi-professional. You didn't work. You trained every morning between 8 and 12 on the AstroTurf. And you had a big, uh, a big match every Wednesday afternoon. And then we used to all play, play semi-pro uh, for local teams. So he knew that he was never going to have me as a soldier. So he said, well, I need to fill a slot, a billet in the gym. So you're going on your PTI course. Mm. And that's how I managed to get it fast track so so quickly. And then what that course consists of? So I flew back to Holdershot and it was right next to one of my <laughs> old schools. And and it, it's basically you they get into a position that you can you can teach physical training. So when you go back to units, there's different types of training you can do. You can do gym uh, PT, you can do green PT. Um, the hardest thing is gymnastics. You actually have to do gymnastics and it's like, mm. you know, it's like a flying track suit, just flow, throw a t-shirt in the air, probably look more elegant than me. Um, but, but it's just so you're in a position when you go back to the unit, you can run PT sessions. And then you end up from there, you get done with that, and then you now is when you check into 59 Commando? Yeah, there's a, a little period before uh, between that. So when I was in the gym, I, I was like, I could, see, I could see me almost mirroring my father's career. And I was like, I, I don't want to be 
a tracksuit soldier. You know, I, I want something different. So you saw the possibility of mirroring your father's career and something about it you didn't really you wanted to be you wanted to you wanted to get after it in a different way yeah that's it yeah i wanted to do do something different and so i actually filled out the application form for nine squadron and five nine um but actually on reflection so nine squadron is the airborne engineers which mm -hmm. is back in aldershot where i grew up and five nine commando is down in north devon and it's you know surf heaven down there you know got Saunton beach croyd beach um so well, for me we, we are in san diego and he's yeah. from hawaii so maybe it's not quite surf heaven <laughs> probably <yeah. It laughs> for is. england we'll give it to you <laughs> for england it is yeah, i'll give you that but for me i you know you join the military because you want to you want to see the world you want to experience new things i didn't want to go back to older shots so five nine commander was, was well suited for me so I applied for 5-9 Commando and you have to go do a four week beat up with the unit before you can go on the All Arms Commando course. So, they, so you go to the unit first and they kind of do an assessment? That's it, yeah. And then and then from there you go to, that's then, sort of like Ranger School in America. You can go to a Ranger Battalion and you haven't been to Ranger School yet. And yeah. then you go to Ranger School. That's it, yeah, it's like that. But back in Germany during this process when the paperwork was in, um, one of the one of the squadrons had just returned from Northern Ireland, and they had like a welcome back party in the camp camp bar. There is a course called um, Assault Engineers, where infantry can come do engineering courses. And there was an infantry unit called the Fusiliers, who were on camp doing that. But they are troublemakers, basically. They were banned from downtown because they're always causing trouble. So they were on camp. And this evening that they had the big uh, the family get together, they were in the bar as well. And me and my friend could see they were being quite rude to some of the, we call them pads wives, you know, the, the lads wives, you know. Uh, so me and my friend, you know, decided to open up on, on a couple of them. So we ended up, you know, putting down three guys. My, 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 my sergeant major came in. He's like, right, you boys go to bed. You know, it's brushed under the carpet. I was then rudely awoken by a military policeman two hours later saying, you're under arrest. And um, so before I went over to 5-9 Commando, I... I there was possibility that I could be getting court-martialed for this fight. So I, I went over anyway. I did the first week of the beat-up. Um, then the course staff sergeant pulls me in. He said, you, you've got to fly to Germany. They're doing an ID parade. I was like, okay. So I flew. ID parade is some kind of investigation? Investigation with the police. Yeah, they want to line you up with other other, other guys. and are you, are you like totally distraught at this point? Um. I'm not totally distraught. I, I, you do worry about your career, how this can can affect your your career. So I, I flew over, and me at the time, I still hadn't grown into my ears. So I just stood out like you know a sore thumb, and and they all knew me as the PTI. So straight away they just beelined. Yeah, that's the guy. My friend who did it with me, however, his his brother was in the squadron as well, so he never got picked out. So I was like, okay, great. <laughs> um, so I flew back to finish the beat up. You know, they said, yeah, you're fit enough, you're ready. So I went on and did the did the commander course. And um, when we finished the commander course, 10 weeks later, we go back to 5-9 commando. And the OC is like that. He said, right, guys, you guys are going across the water. And the squadron were in Northern Ireland. So I thought, perfect, we're off to Northern Ireland. He said, not you, stop. He said, you're going across the other water. You're going back to Germany. He said, we need to get this, get this cleared. So I went back to Germany and... Um, Basically, they said, look, you can go court martial and it probably would get thrown out, but that's going to be another 12 months to 18 months. You know, I've just passed the commander course. I wanted to go f be with the commandos. So I just pleaded guilty. Um, I got charged. And so I spent 56 days in the military correction training center, which is Colchester Prison, known as the Glass House. <laughs> and, but the, the commanding officer, actually, because everyone knew it was me and the other guy, you know, mm -hmm. they and they knew these guys were troublemakers. They're like, yeah, you just unfortunately got caught out. So the commanding officer was a, an airborne guy, an airborne engineer. This is the commanding officer at Colchester. No, no, this oh, is this, this is, is the German. Yeah, they, no, this is in Germany. Okay, but, but you know, so I have to leave that unit first. And so the RSM marches me, and the RSM was one of a, a football player with me, <laughs> and uh, and he's like, ah, right, you know, Sapper Stott. Um, I was going to give you 60 days, but because you've done the all arms commander course, I've taken four days off. Uh, any questions? <laughs> I said, yes, if I'd gone airborne, would I got more days off? <laughs> and he sort of giggled and he said, like, you know, it's time for you to go. So, so yeah, I spent uh, 56 days in Her Majesty's 
a corrective training center. Yeah, I was looking. I didn't know what Colchester was, but mm. it's basically the, it's the same term. Echo Charles. When you hear somebody say Leavenworth, what do you think of? Yeah, prison. Yeah, yeah military yeah, prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. kind of the way Colchester. I think it's the last military prison. Really, in England or something? There's yeah. some, it's everybody knows it. The Glass House. It's, it's the Glass House. It's the equivalent yeah, yeah. of Leavenworth. Yeah, and, and and everyone has you know you hear horror stories coming out of the Glass House, and, and what and what it actually is is because when you you have an escort that drops you off, and the instructors are there to meet you, and it's like it is like a scene out of Full Metal Jacket. They are screaming and shouting at you, but as mm. soon as they've gone, they just treat you like adults. Mm. You know, what I mean, it's um, they take away all those sort of. Those creature comforts, you know, you don't, you're not allowed to phone anyone. It's um, two PT sessions a day. It's room inspections all the time. I actually really enjoyed Colchester. Um, <laughs> I, I said if if I got paid full full wages, I, I would I would have really enjoyed it. And it got to a stage actually where guys were going into Colchester and coming out better soldiers, a lot better soldiers. And they were actually getting promoted when they got back to their units. And they had to stop that. They said, no, it's, <laughs> it's, it's you know, you're there for the wrong, you know, for bad, uh, bad reasons. You can't be seen to be, be promoted. So I did, I did my time there and um, went back to five, nine. Right. Rewind a little bit to the commando yeah. course. Yes. Well, how was that? Yeah. So I remember my father dropping me off at driving me to North Devon to do the beat up. And then, you know, I obviously hadn't told him about the incident in Germany at this point. And he said, you know, these guys will, you know, these guys will, will make you a man, you know what I mean? So you're obviously really nervous about things like that. But, um, but it is that the beat up's great. You know, the five nine beat up, they actually is harder than the all arms commander course. So if you can reach their levels and their expectations, then as long as you stay away from injury, when you go on the all arms commander course, you, you should be fine. So the all arms commander courses for any cap badges, so engineers, artillery, anyone who's going to be serving alongside free commander brigade with the Royal Marines uh, or any naval, um, you know, doctors, dentists mm. uh, as well. So you've got a, a mixture on on that course and you've got guys who are young privates all the way through to quite senior officers who may have just been a, attached to the brigade. And we also have foreign um, foreign militaries there. I remember we had a, a SEAL, uh, no, a Marine on our course as well, US Marine mm-hmm. on our course. We had some guys from Lebanon. We had some guys from Russia. We had, we had all sorts on there. And basically they get you to a standard. So you're understanding the Royal Marines sort of TTPs, their SOPs. Mm-hmm. So when you go to unit, you understand that, that how they operate as well. You know, you, you do amphibious warfare as well. I mean, you also do their commando tests. So their commando tests, you know, the thirty miler, which is the last one to get your, your green beret, and all the, all the other tests that, that build up to it. And it's ten weeks long, and I could be a doctor that's going to get attached to. I could be a thirty-nine year old doctor that's going to be attached to commando, yeah. and I got to go through that and get a thirty-pound ruck on. It, it, I think for them, they they have to, they they volunteer for it. You know, they, they can still serve with the brigade, but it's almost like. You know, I mean, you, you, they see that you've made the effort and you've got the cover of Green Beret, um, you know, probably to get less pressure if, they, if they've done the course. But actually saying that, the, the Navy guys were really good because uh, a few years later, which we'll touch on, I ended up being an instructor on, the, on this commander course. So the Navy guys, because they have no military background before this, they've not picked up any bad habits. Mm-hmm. So what the instructors were telling them, they, they were do. picking up straight away. Whereas you may have a... A sergeant or a staff sergeant who's you know been in 14 years and he's already picked up his little bad habits and he's ha- having to you know realigning or reset that whole whole uh, cog um but for us our course i, I didn't learn anything if i'm on mm-hmm. i learned nothing on our course um every one of our instructors got sacked at the end of the course our course was very officer heavy and it was like we weren't allowed to wear Gore-Tex. If it rained, it, we didn't learn anything. It was about who could survive in the cold and, and, and who was the fittest. Actually learning anything soldier-wise, I picked up when I got to the unit. But that backfired on the instructors because at the end of the course, they do like course critiques. You know, how was your course? And because it was so officer heavy, that they went to town on them. Oh, they that's went, right. Yeah, yeah. They went. They went to town on because enlisted guys get handed a critique and they're like, "Good, good, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, good." Yeah, yeah. I'm going to get a beer. <laughs> <laughs> Officers like, "Well, let me state my opinion on this matter." <laughs> oh yeah, they backfired. Every every uh, instructor got sacked, apart from the two army guys, the engineer Jeez. and and the artillery officer. But for me, I'm still. I'm only 18. I'm 
you know you're still developing as a as a young man you know i wasn't I wasn't fully grown. I remember the load carries being, you know, really difficult. You're carrying some excess weight there, um, and it's very different from like P Company, the Paras. That's, that's all more that they're leaner and and then they go faster with, with with less weight. Whereas the Commandos, they sort of tend to be bigger guys uh, carrying more weight but mm-hmm. at a slower speed. So you know, I, I I do think that's probably one of the hardest courses still to date. But that's because I hadn't developed yet fully. Mm-hmm. Now, I got to pull this one section out of the book because I thought it was worth uh, reading. This is when you're in Colchester and you have this conversation. Um, You say, drink was a big problem in the forces at the time. I'd be surprised if it isn't still. And so when I was interviewed by the officer of the prison, I was grilled about my alcohol consumption. You were drunk when you hit the other soldiers, correct? Yes, sir. So do you have a drinking problem? No, sir. I'd have hit them anyways. Hmm, what happened to your wrist? And this is another thing you explain. I fell out of a window, sir, trying to urinate, sir. Were you drunk? Well, yes, sir. Hmm, so you don't have a drinking problem. (laughs) I didn't really know how to reply to that one. As far as I saw it, it was just part of army life, part of being a squatty. If I had a drinking problem, maybe the whole army did. Personally, I felt like it was just being one of the boys. The officer dismissed me. And then you go on to the fact that you enjoyed being at Colchester, which is, which is cool. You, yeah. you had a good time, but that's a, uh, that's one of those things. As I was reading it, I've I had quite a few conversations with young seals. You know, hey, so you got in another fight in a bar, right? And that's why you're in here talking to me. Yeah, were you drinking? Yeah, and you also were here three months ago, and you were also in another fight in a bar, and you were drinking. You see any common things here? No. <laughs> any commonalities between these incidents? No, I don't know. Mm. I'm, I like to fight, I guess. <sighs> I gotta watch out for that one. You get to, um, you get to, to, to fi- do you call it 5'9 five, or 59? 5'9, five, five, nine. Nine, yeah. You get to 5'9 and uh, I thought this was cool. Couldn't have asked for a better beginning to my time at 5'9". The admin officer took one look at my report from Colchester, seemed happy with what he saw, and ripped it up. Fresh start. But it was a lonely start. The rest of the squadron was in Northern Ireland, finishing the tour I'd missed out on doing to my, due to my time in Collie. I was gutted not to be a part of that, but it ended up working my favor. We're sending you on a diving aptitude course. Usually guys have to wait years to get on this, so consider yourself lucky. So because the other guys were deployed in Northern Ireland, you got an opportunity to go to this dive course. Yeah, that's it. So in the Royal Engineers, we we have divers. So everything um, you can do on the surface, be it uh, broco cutting, um, welding, mm-hmm. carpentry, scaffolding, okay. everything, we, we, we can do subsurface. Do you guys call that hard hat diving? Um, the OSDS, which is the Open Supply Dive System, the Kirby Morgan uh-huh. helmets. That that's part of it. So scuba's part of it, and 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 so is and so is that. But we group everything. Mm. If you're not doing combat swimmer operations, yeah. like if you're just if you're doing any kind of work, we just call it hard hat diving. Like, yeah. like it's a hard hat diving. It's like good, good for you. Yeah. But like yeah, that's the way we classify anything that's not Drager, yeah. combat swimmer, ship attack. You know, it's like hard hat diving. Yeah. Hey, before it. before you dive into that. So this this going to Colchester, mm. that's is that on your record or when that guy shredded it was it gone? I think it stays on my record. I mm. think he was just trying to prove a point. Is yeah. you know we draw fresh the start. line fresh fresh start. But actually a lot of a lot of guys who do well in the military, a lot of these RSMs, you look back, especially the guards, they've been to Colchester. It was almost you touched on it then in that you'd, you'd brief up a guy for drinking and three months later you come in and you tell him this again. Well, obviously he's he's making a mistake. Yeah. So I learned from my mistake and I learned at an early stage. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, it didn't happen later on in my career um, and then obviously have bigger consequences because I still didn't have rank at that point. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, no, it's, I, so in the in the Navy, you have service stripes on your uniform. Yeah. And if you've never been in trouble, those service stripes are gold. So when you're in your dress uniform and you see a Navy guy, a Navy master chief or a senior chief, and they're in their uniform, they'll have service stripes. So it's like one stripe for every four years. You okay, can, right. So you can have a lot of stripes after mm. 28 years. Yeah. And if you've never been in trouble, they're gold. But if you've been in trouble, if you have like a captain's mask or something like that, they're red. And it was, in, it was always interesting to see that there would be guys that would be master chiefs and they'd have, the, they'd have red stripes, meaning they got in trouble at some mm. point in their career. 
And uh, the reason I ask that is because, you know, it's uh, as more and more focus, sort of more and more attention to the SEAL teams, you know, it was like a lot less of a, there was, a, there was more of a zero defect mentality. Right. And if you got in trouble one time, it was going to stay with you and it was going to be a problem. So, you, so those gold versus red mm-hmm. stripes, was it kind of like, it's kind of cool to have the red one or is it kind of cool to have the gold one? It, like what is the it deal? It depends on your assessment of the it, situation. That's what I mean. Like what was the common, like the culture? Like if you've seen a guy and, and one guy had a gold, one guy Not had red. Not a huge deal. Not mm. a huge deal, but like BTF Tony? Yeah, yeah. Red. <laughs> All day. <red. laughs> he's one of my buddies and he's <laughs> yeah. like, you know, just a, a break glass in case of war type of dude. And yeah, he had red. So it kind of depends on the person's like personality, like it's a case by case. Almost, yeah, and this what? is this is, you know, back in the day when guy, yeah, you know, when guys were getting in trouble more because there's also less going on, and really a lot of it boils down to leadership too. You know, if your if your leadership isn't giving you stuff to do and pointing you in the right direction, where do you end up if you're 18 years old? If you're 20. One years old. If you're 19 years old and you don't, you're not given good direction. Where do you end up as a as a young male? Where do you end up, Echo Charles? Jail. Well, possibly, but definitely in a pub. Definitely, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. being aggressive. Definitely doing the. That's what you're gonna do. Yeah. And so, if you haven't gotten some good guidance, then it's gonna be problematic. And you know, we're getting better at it, but it definitely is. It's good to hear that you could you could have a a mistake like that. And look, you could be, how many times did you not get caught, right? Of course, exactly. yeah. yeah, plenty of times. This time you got caught. It's good that you could get caught, learn a lesson, and move on. It's also very interesting that people would come out of that highly disciplined environment, highly disciplined environment in Colchester, and do better as humans. Yeah, do better as soldiers. That's freaking legit. Yeah. That's proof. Proof of what? Proof that discipline equals freedom. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that's kind of a good deal where, like, yeah, you can go to prison, mm. essentially, and get what, I mean, would you call it rehabilitated? Like, if you're improved, that, when yeah, you absolutely. come out of it, I, I mean, think. isn't, shouldn't that sort of be the goal? I think yeah. so. Yeah, I think so. You know, like I said, it's, you know, we, we have something similar. We don't have the, the bands on our arms, but if you have 15 years of, of, of good discipline you get the long service good conduct medal there you uh, go. yeah you have things you know to aspire to but you know i think everyone will, will get in trouble as, as, as long as you learn from it it's, it's character building as well you know <laughs> thankfully for me it was at an early age like my good friend now he's he's the rsm in the ses he was in colchester prison with me as well <laughs> so but that's what it is it started to be almost like oh uh people are getting promoted and that's the wrong reasons for be going there right. um but as you, if you come out a, a different man, different soldier, but like I said, the instructions in there were amazing. And that's probably, you know, that was reflective on the guys when they came out. Well, it's interesting that you actually call them instructors yeah. and not guards, right? Yeah. When you go into the Navy brig, if you're in the Marine Corps or the Navy, you get in trouble, you go into the brig. Right. And those are guards. They're not instructors. So it's kind of cool that they were actually trying to... Well, do you think that they were trying to teach you? They were yeah. trying to move well, you, you forward? Yeah, well, you, you have military lessons. It is just being on camp, but you're just locked up at night. That's the only hmm. difference. Yeah. Um, you know, you are going to, uh, you're doing drill. You know, the guards, like today, we're going to take off on the runway and they'll just be marching as fast as you can. I mean, you have the gym instructors. I mean, you do aircraft recognition. You'd be, you'd be on the ranges. You'd go for runs. PT, you would run out of the camp gates. And I remember running like that thinking... But I knew that if someone wanted to take a bolt for it and you stopped them, it reduced your sentence. I was I was keeping an eye out, you know, for any sort of uh, <laughs> oh, really? any sharp <laughs> movement. You tackled somebody. Yeah, get, yeah, yeah. Re- but I think you you, like you have an interview <laughs> when you go in, and they they sort of say, you know, you got all sorts in there. You have got guys who who don't want to be in the military. You know, you've got a what? Mm-hmm. You have got guys with drugs. You got you know you know there's all things. And and when I you know you just honest, I like, got into a fight and they're like. You just got caught. Mm-hmm. That's it. At the end of the day, they, they, they understood. They've probably been in the position you've been in before, mm-hmm. but just didn't get caught. So, so it's like more. I mean, it's like the, a different approach essentially than mm-hmm. like a you know like when you think of prison outside of the military, mm-hmm. you're like, no, that's your punishment straight yeah. up. Like you, you're. It's essentially like the the difference between a beating and a counseling kind yeah. of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like you know what you're talking about is kind of a counseling. Like, hey, you did this. Let's 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 kind of. D- reap benefits from this whole situation, improve yeah. you. Well, they have programs like this, now that I think about it, they have programs like this in America, I don't know if they have them in England, but they take kids that are on the wrong track and they put them into like a highly disciplined 
military yeah. militaristic environment right. and it definitely can straighten them out yeah. I, I sponsored a kid going through one of those things and went up there and saw what they were doing and it's like a lot of those kids really turn around and, and start doing well yeah so yeah and then but then if you just get the beating it's like you just it's yeah it's just a different yeah. approach right it's it is more a, effective i think for the military you know if you come out a different person you know if you, if you come out and then you reoffend, then obviously the, the, there's a problem yeah. um but i think it's almost like yes it's one strike yeah um, because mm-hmm. you, you you can go in and you have 28 days and under and 28 days and older it's like two different wings and you sort of look down <laughs> at, <laughs> yeah you look down at the 28 <laughs> you days you and said under. that in the book you're like i'm competitive <laughs> about it you guys are over here for 28 yeah. days i'm big time <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got the ones that actually we're going to get discharged the mm-hmm. military as well but rather than just throwing them out the gates they would go do plumbing courses carpenter courses so mm-hmm. there was stuff there there to help them yeah man that's squared away mm-hmm. okay so i cut you off when you were starting to talk about dive school I, i'm sorry but yeah no it's yeah so um but for so the royal engineers have divers i think we have about 450 uh, divers at the moment and and basically what um when I was in Germany, there was always things on orders asking for guys who want to go on a dive course. Because everyone's heard of P Company, the para course, and the All Arms Commander course. But the dive course, I, I think it's probably one of the most arduous and underrated and underrated courses. But it's also an additional qual, so you get you get more money. Yeah. Look, back back in the day when I did it, was only two pounds sixty five, so about five dollars a day. Uh, but now you're talking, you know, twenty pounds, so thirty five, forty dollars. So there used to always be anyone That's want to go a lot on a of course backs, right yeah, exactly yeah <laughs> exactly but there was they'd struggle to get volunteers from other units because of the guys from the airborne engineers and commando engineers because they're already physically robust that, that, that there's a waiting list you know yeah. you are at the back of that list um but because they're all in germany uh, so all in northern ireland they're out well you're going on the app shoot so i literally must have just fast tracked two or three years to get on the on this course so I went and did my my aptitude, and and how I've seen diving change over the years. This was back in ninety in ninety seven, um, and it was it was called a Desca diving set self contained compressed air. It's like scuba, mm-hmm. but it was n- no comms. We don't have any comms. It was nil visibility. Uh, the only way we communicate, we had a lifeline, a uh, rope around our chest with a bowline, and they just do pulls and bells. So. Is an alien, as you know, underwater, it's an alien environment. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of guys don't like it. But for me, being surfing, and I, I love the water. It was almost like, for me, I'm more comfortable underwater <laughs> than I am on, on land. So, so I did that course, came back, and the squadron had just returned from Northern Ireland. So here's me now in this new unit, just stolen everyone's dive course, which everyone's on the waiting list for. Uh, and they've obviously heard I've just come out of Colchester Prison. So there's a couple, there was a couple of names within the unit, like you know, squadron bullies. And they're like, oh, wait till such and such uh, sees you. And I was like, here we go. And we had a Christmas party. And uh, one of the lads just comes over. He said, oh, you, you think you're handy? And just, no, just full on, <laughs> straight in the face. And I was like, oh, God. So, I, you know, I just, I just right hooked him back. And, you know, he, he stepped back and said, oh, that's all I needed to know. And uh, I think that sort of, you know, gave my, my foot in the door within the unit. But what 5-9 uh, Commando used to be the Army Minor Unit Boxing Champions. And each year, they because they won the final, they'd automatically go to the final the next year. Mm. And each year our opponents were the Airborne Engineers. So this was coming up in January, three months training. I didn't have a choice. They're like, well... You've been to Colchester Prison. You're on the boxing team. I was like, really? <laughs> so, um, so we went. I, I just spent three months. Did you ever box before? I did in in Guildford, where near, near Surrey. Uh, one of my friends from school. We went to a place called Belfields. Mm-hmm. So I did a bit of boxing there. And again, my father didn't want me boxing, mm-hmm. and I sort of had an agreement. And he said, "Well, look, I'll box until I get beat, and then, you know, then I'll stop." So thankfully, I never, I never got beat. I only had two, about three fights, I think, mm-hmm. when I was when I was there. But in the military, in five nine commando, it's it's just pure fitness. There's no boxing skill uh, at all, and we would have three or four PT sessions um, a day. And rather than like lose the weight over a period of time, they lose the weight in a short period, and then you've got to maintain it. But um, three months later, we had the Army Mine Units finals, and there's other guys from the squadron based at other training units, and you can see him reading the book like, "Who's this stock? Who's this new lad?" And we thought we were going to walk away with it. And at the interval, it was two all. There's seven fights of the night. It's two all at the interval. 
and I remember the sergeant major coming in and he's just like in my chest he said you need to do you know poking me right in the middle of the chest and I was like oh my god and um, I, I came out and I, I think I had tears in my eyes and the adrenaline w- w- was pumping but I went out and I knocked the guy down uh, three times in a minute and 20 seconds and, and that literally you know I'd made my mark within 5-9 commando and I settled in quite well that's an awesome good story um, you go you go here in the book you say it wasn't it wasn't long into my time at 5-9 that I was selected for recce troop a kind of elite within the squadron. It was a huge privilege as Recky was known as being a great stepping stone towards the special forces, an idea that I'd begun to toy with, thinking about my future in the army. So you end up in Recky troop. That's it, yeah. So in, in free commando brigade, you have five nine commando, uh, the engineers that support the brigade, you have two nine commando, the artillery. And within free commando brigade, they have their own sort of, um, reconnaissance troop called um, Brigade Recce Force or Brigade Patrol Brigade Patrol Troop from the Marines mm-hmm. which consists of snipers and, and mountain leaders but also p- part of that group is naval gunfire mm-hmm. from the artillery and also 5-9 recce troop so we're almost like eyes on the ground advanced eyes on the ground you know giving input on potential combat engineering tasks so you have to be selected from recce troop within 5-9 commando and they, t- they did that in Norway so each year we used to go to Norway for three months, um, the whole of the brigade, and we do Arctic warfare training. It was all f- due to the Cold War. Mm-hmm. If the Russians were starting to head west across Norway, that we'd be able to, you know, to stop them. So, you know, and, and Norway's uh, an equalizer. You know, that, that separates the boys from the men. So I'd got, my name had been uh, picked up to go recce troop. And um, so, yeah, so very fortunate to get selected again at a young age. To, to go recce troop and um, within 5-9 commando it's actually classed as a posting so my time had started again as I, as I entered in, into recce troop as you touched on there a recce troop had a 100% pass rate for UK special forces selection so guys I, I would see guys leaving and, and, and never come back um, so for me it was when I then started my head started turning towards the opportunity of special forces you know my dad told me I'd last two minutes. I managed to get through basic training. I've done a PTI. I managed to get through Colchester. I managed to get through the commando course. I'm now just about to get my, my para wings. And you're also then amongst like-minded individuals, those who want to go or aspire to be special forces. So, um, so yeah, that was recce troop for me. Did you, did you go through any official training for recce troop? Do you have to go to a school or is it just from the unit itself you get trained up? They, they had their own selection process within, within the unit. And then you used to have to go do P Company, which is the, the Airborne Engineers uh, course. But when I, when I got there, our troop staff sergeant, you know, said there's no need to do P Company. You know, we we'll, would run our own selection process, which disgruntled some of the older boys. They felt, no, oh, you have to do P Company. Um, but there was a big difference as well now in, in the guys that were going recce troop compared to the guys of old. So the guys of old were like you, Jocker. They were just huge. You know, <laughs> they, they were just massive guys. It was all about fitness. Whereas now, you know, the world was sort of evolving. The Balkans had kicked off. And so 5-9 Commando went to um, Bosnia. And recce troop, we went to, to Kosovo with Brigade Recce Force. Well, this was the first operational tour for recce troop since the Falklands War. Mm. Um, so the guys in between that period hadn't seen any action, and then we then uh, went o- went over to Kosovo, which was great for us. Yeah, and you you say here uh, one day I called home to the UK with news for my dad. He'd probably forgotten long ago about our two minutes conversation in the car. I had and I had a big smile on my face as I gave him the news. I'm going to Kosovo. I told the old soldier, I'm going on tour. And this is in this is in 2000. So if you were going to do something real. Going into going into the going into Kosovo was as good as it was going to get at that time. At that time, yeah. Then, um, what what types of missions were you doing there? So, Brigade Recce Force. So, we were we were doing as a, you know forward observation. Um, for example, one the first. I mean, it's in the book actually. The first op we went on, it, it was like, right, we're going on the ground. We're on ops, uh, and so basically there was a five k buffer zone between Serbia and Kosovo, and they didn't want any sort of any Serbians in there, any Kosovans in there, because that you know that's where it was all kicking off. So a lot of our work was on the border, but there was also those that uh, 
committed horrific crimes, crimes of war as well. So we were also identifying these HVTs, getting imagery from them, and then obviously getting guys to come in and pick them up. So we were having to grab you know, camera kit straight off civilian shelves, mm-hmm. you know, walking in with a great big lens and things like that. And uh, I remember the first job we went on and we inserted. We had our, our intelligence brief, we inserted. And as we were patrolling you know, to the FRV, uh, I, I was a rear man and I, I kept hearing something and I sort of that. stop the team get down on one knee you know all around the fence and we're all looking through our sights you know there's nothing there but you can hear almost like the creeping in the leaves you know someone sneaking up on us anyway th- this carried on <laughs> all the way through we got to the position even when we're in the OP position we could hear it um, we got the imagery we needed and about you know two weeks later we, we extracted so you're in the field for two weeks in the field and for the two whole weeks. time you're hearing this noise at night you hear these pro- probable enemy approaching yeah. your position yeah yeah we, ready for the fight the whole time you, you're thinking of the worst you know you, sh- you shouldn't be there and things like that and uh, so when we extracted um, we, we went back to camp and we, we have the, a debrief and I you know any points I'm like yeah you know, I don't know whether we were compromised. It felt like we were compromised, but there was a lot of movement, you know, especially at night. And then some, some, you know, call him, call him Green Slime, the intelligence corps. <laughs> this guy, is that, oh, I, f- I did forget to mention, it's breeding season for the tortoises. <laughs> so actually, what we were si- hearing was the tortoises coming out to mate. Um, <laughs> but it kept the whole patrol on stand two for two weeks. <laughs> uh so you guys are doing recon patrols. How big of a teams are you guys rolling out with? So we're in six man teams. Yeah, six man team. And and you're staying for up to two weeks out there? It, we we did four weeks once. Um, yeah, we we got to um, basically we got an int report in that there was a, a a training camp in the in the five k buffer zone. The Serbians basically said, "You deal with them, or we'll deal with them." And so we inserted, remember, you know, snow on the ground as well. And because we were Arctic trained, we were the best guys you know, mm-hmm. for the job. So we inserted, did our tents, and we we're in observation OPs for, for four weeks and um, just feeding back all the intelligence. And then they were, it was a military training school. They were doing heavy, heavy weapons training, small arms training. It was, it was quite well disciplined. And we were actually then relieved by the Americans. The Americans, you know, came in and took over from us for, uh, four weeks later. And I think subsequently from that, SF did go in and actually take down, take down the, uh, the, the training camp. But um, for me, yeah, four weeks in the, in the snow, um, you know, separates the boys from the men. <laughs> What's the op tempo like when you'd get back? How, how often would, how much downtime would you get and then you'd roll back out? Uh, we'd be rolling, you know, we'd, we'd obviously deservice and reservice, but it was, it was everything from urban to rural. You know, we, we were doing stuff as well in, in, in vehicles. We had snipers in, in, in the tall buildings in the middle of Pristina. Mm-hmm. Um, so the jobs would range from that to, you know, we, we did get into about one of, the lo- one of the local government guys is going to be an assassination attempt on him. So we're obviously having to keep an eye on, eye on him all the time as well. And I remember actually seeing two guys and we, we got out, we were in, civilian attire and we walked up to walking up towards him could we see could see the big the guys that we knew were going to take him down and they caught our eye and they caught theirs and they just went the other way and actually it was a dry rehearsal Mm -hmm. we just compromised a dry rehearsal they weren't doing it then which obviously kept him alive probably for another month i think he did get assassinated after we left Mm -hmm. so you had to be how old are you right at this point uh night night i'm 22 yeah so you're just all kinds of fired up for this This is living the dream Oh yeah, yeah, it's everything, everything you, you dream about and read about. Yeah, You're doing it for real. You you go through this uh, this here in the book as you close out this chapter. We were just about to head home from Kosovo when we were fastballed onto a task. We're going to apprehend a bomb maker. We were told, and the adrenaline began to buzz in my veins. Sitting through the intel brief, we learned that someone had been cooking up bombs that were being used to take out politicians. The bomb maker wasn't the one using them. He was more like a chef for hire. Understandably, NATO were keen to get him off the streets. I wasn't the one to grab him, but a couple of the other guys bundled him into the back of our vehicles, of our vehicle. His hands were tied behind his back and despite our orders to keep his eyes on the floor, he kept looking up and around him. I put a hand on the back of his head to help his concentration. That's bang out of order, the man shouted in a sharp, Manchunian accent as I've ever heard. So that's a Manchester accent? Manchester accent. My jaw dropped 
and I looked around at the other guys in the team. Not for one moment had we suspected that the bomb maker could be a fellow countryman. When we dropped him off for questioning, I bet he wished he'd stayed at home. There was a solitary chair in the center of a courtyard with two bright spotlights shining onto it. Very James Bond. We left the bomb maker to answer for his crimes. It was time for us to go home. So you guys were running. So those, those are great ops, you know? Yeah, great, great ops getting bad guys. Um, who'd you turn him over to? Who's going to interrogate him? Um, I think it was our intelligence services, okay. yeah. Relatively gentle then. Mm. <laughs> uh, so then this is the point where you get uh, the offer to or the selected once again yeah. to go be an instructor. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, at, at Limstone, am I saying it right? Limston, yeah. Limston. So you go to Limston to to be an instructor of that commando course which you which you had gone through and the one that you said everyone got fired. Yeah, yeah, that's it, yes. And so how was that? Yeah, great. Obviously, it's a great privilege to go back. So so what we used to do um, with 5-9 recce troop, we, each each troop within 5-9 had to have a guy who did guard duties and things like that. So we were exempt from guard duties. And from that, we would send an instructor on the commander course for a year. So you're actually, it was, again, it was classed as a post in out the unit, but you're, you're still attached. So again, when I talk about being an ambassador, you're an ambassador now f- for the cat badge. And this was only about four years after me doing my own course so i always remember my course thinking well you know when we were on our course we had to build build up the uh, the instructors tents you know we were doing a lot for them when i got there it was night and day you know we did our own tents um but the instruction had changed completely they we were doing everything that the students were doing we were wearing the same equipment and we didn't have any you know gucci kit as well we were wearing exactly what they they had and because you were you were as an ambassador you obviously had to be seen to be doing what what they were doing which i thought was a great way of teaching don't ask them if you can't do it yourself and and so yeah it was night night and day the we had a couple of instructors on the course and you know i soon learned how you can get the most out of of your students i know when i was on my course you know i didn't learn anything and i always remember that i thought well i don't want this to happen to these young boys you know i want them to be in a good position when they go to their unit because you're going to go back to five nine and you're going to be serving along alongside these guys as well but we had a couple of instructors and they would just come out every morning just scream and shout you know what i mean i think the, the the marine instructors they felt they they had a bad a bad deal going on the all arms commander course um but in fact actually they enjoyed it. They, they really opened their eyes to how good these guys were at soldiering. You know, the Marines, because it's nine months long, they're so proud of their tradition. And they see these, uh, you know, these army guys coming in and doing 10 weeks, but they don't realize what they've done before that before they've got there. But these guys would come out and scream and shout. And, then, and, and you could see these students' eyes. It was almost like straight in the press-up position and, you know, they got nothing back. Um, whereas for me... If, it was all about the banter. It's about humor. You need to have a, have a sense of humor and, and be approachable. So if I had to tell them to do press-ups, I would do the press-ups with them. I remember also there was a law that we could only do 30 press-ups. Mm. Like, really? A law? <laughs> yeah, within okay. Limston, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they started introducing the maximum you can do is 30 press-ups. But there's ways you can get around that, you mm-hmm. know, because you can do a press-up, you can do a half press-up, you can hold it for a few seconds <laughs> and then fully down, you know. Yeah. So we, we, we did that. I mean, there's ways, ways around it. But for them as, as as students, you know, I was seeing a better product at the end than probably what they did of me uh, four years before. So I did like I did like that change. Do the, you feel like you were able? Like I was very lucky because I was got new instructor roles and was able to teach. I taught everything. It was awesome. I felt like I learned a lot while I was teaching because now you're observing. I mean, from a leadership perspective, you know, I was when I was at E five, so I was like a young junior guy. I was teaching the young officers that were going through our basic, it was called SEAL tactical training at the time. So I'm out there telling them how to run immediate action drills and telling them like, hey, no one's listening to you. You need to step back. You need to take a look around. I learned so much from doing that. Did you feel like you in this instructor mode got to learn? Yeah, I got to learn learn a lot myself, yeah. And and like I said, we, we call it the sugar pedestal. We used to have to always do the demonstrations before the students. So it's like, do not mess this up. <laughs> <laughs> so our drills had to be had to be slick and, and quick. But on my first course, we had the first female mm. candidate to do the all arms commander course. And yeah, she, in the book you call her what? Lieutenant Y. 
Lieutenant Y, yeah, Lieutenant yeah, Y, yeah, we had to yeah, protect her name <laughs> yeah. for legal reasons. But um, she'd done two, she had two previous attempts, and this was her third attempt. And so the instructors who took her on her initial two uh, courses were, were dismissed from the training team, and we had another training team sort of come in. So you could already see it's going to be it's getting steered that way. Mm -hmm. But basically, um, what it was is. They wanted a female to pass the commander course mm -hmm. and people don't realize it's actually basically if a female hadn't passed the commander course they were going to lower the standards until a female passed but that mm -hmm. would be standard throughout male and female right. so the fact that she went on and passed we we didn't lower the standards so people don't see see the bigger the bigger picture um behind the scenes so so when you talk about her in the book she mm -hmm. didn't pass it's not that she di didn't pass. There was two ladies on the course. It was Lieutenant Y and I'll say Lieutenant X. Uh, Lieutenant X was a, uh, a doctor who's actually from 5'9". And she did everything that was asked of her. You know, she, she struggled uh, and things like that. Whereas Lieutenant Y was almost playing the system. She knew that if she could go to the doctor, she would get two days light duties. Mm. But the way the timings of that used to always be for a mm. commando test. So she'd rest up for a couple of days for the commando test. And it was that. It wasn't the fact that she didn't. It was the fact that she played the system well. Mm -hmm. um, Lieutenant X, you know, she, I remember one of the guys, uh, Daz, who uh, went on to be chief instructor of the sniper school. We were doing some close quarter CQB. And, he, you know, you'd follow the student through. And then at the end, you'd, you'd give him a debrief. And he's like, he comes through with a student. He said, that guy was brilliant. Um, and then me and him started chatting and as we looked over it was like a scene from a shampoo advert she took her helmet off and just brushed her hair down <laughs> and we were both of us our, our, our jaws hit the floor and I was like ah. I said well if she was good you tell her mm -hmm. you know you tell it if she was good and, and he did yeah you, you're excellent but unfortunately week five you do your, your bottom field test which is like a, an assault course and you have to climb a 30 foot rope and she was about a foot and a half just below that rope so she didn't progress on that course but i do think you know if she had not it instructed without any qualms so at was all. that lieutenant x or lieutenant y That's left lieutenant x okay yeah and, and but you're saying eventually she did make it through lieutenant uh, no lieutenant y she 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 oh, made it through okay. on that course she made it through on that on that course and it was almost to just dampen the white noise you know mm -hmm. white, white hall like we need a female to pass we need a female to pass um but you can imagine what the airborne lads were like you know what i mean yeah. it was like oh my god you know you used to get phone calls my wife's on paternity leave for 10 weeks come in come down and do your course <laughs> like, really <laughs> yeah it was, it was the good banner and then you also talked about a, a guy that was what 50 something years old yeah just a beast yeah so you know even when, you know, Lieutenant Y passed, I was getting blueies from the lads who are in Afghan. They're like, yeah, well done. You know what I mean? It was like, you know, lads from the Special Forces don't even bother coming on selection. It's like a big thing, a female passing. But to be honest, you know, she deserved to pass. And I, I generally believe that if you deserve to pass, you know, you've earned the right. And so, yeah, the next course, this gentleman turns up, Captain Fox, and he's basically going to be the family officer at 2-9 Commando. This guy's 55 years old. And he did P Company four years before I was born, the airborne, you know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we're, we're, there on, we're there on parade. And, and the first thing we do is we do a, um, I think we do a six mile booted march. And it was spring and we came back and it like, you just thrown two buckets of water over this guy. And I was like, I said, are you all right? You know, Captain Fox. So he goes, oh yeah, I, I had pneumonia, you know, 15 years ago. So I can't control my, 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 my sweat. So I was like, oh my. God, this guy's going to die on me. <laughs> but this guy, basically, he had like four-wheel records. He was an ultra-marathon runner. He had, I don't know what it was called, but basically has to keep moving, has to be physically active. But this guy was, was old school. I remember when, you know, teaching uh, the students, the students messed up. And, you know, so I had him on Beastie Knoll up and down this, this hill. And I remember him coming down. Every time he come to me, he'd get in the press-up position. I, I used to feel really embarrassed. like talking to my granddad. I was like, please, please stand up, Captain Fox. I said, what is it? He said, can I take my warm kit off now? I was like, God. I was like, yeah, yeah, please do. But, you know, really humbling uh, being with him. But I remember he was in my, my group and he, we were doing the 30 miler next week. You know, it's the commando test. And the final test is a 30 mile endurance march in, in eight hours. And at the end, you get you covered Green Beret. He said, he said, Corporal Stott, he said, um, is there a grid reference to the finish point? And the finish point actually is a public car park mm -hmm. on, on Dartmoor. I said, yeah, you shouldn't know it, but I said, this is it. Fine. So when it came to the 30 miler, 
Uh, you, I bring him up. It, and so he wanted to know that. Did he clarify why he wanted to yeah, know that? It's because he, he wanted his wife or whatever. Yeah, he wanted his girlfriend to come along. He said, oh, my girlfriend wants to meet me at the end. Do you mind? I said, yeah, fine. So we came over. Cut, cut the old man some slack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Much appreciated. Well, Us did. older dudes say, yeah, right on. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I just had so much respect for him. And in fact, he did the company four years before I was born. So, um, so I said, yeah, of course. And then we did the 30 miler. And... Um, on the last phase, you bring him up a hill called Pooper's Hill. You come and bring him in, and then you stop him short of the end, and you get them to sort themselves out. They put their their cap comfort on, mm-hmm. and, and you know, and, and we march them in. And um, so I was doing that, and as we came round the corner, oh my god, it was like the Super Bowl. <laughs> there was banners there, you know, balloons. I was acting. I said, I thought it was just your girlfriend. He said, Oh yeah, my grandkids as well, <laughs> and my kids. <laughs> Brilliant. I did giggle. Uh, I think this is a good section you had in here just on, on you, you, you touched on it, but just the, the attitude of being an instructor, you say, I think a lot of NCOs came into their positions on courses and, and at units thinking that being shouty, shouty and swearing was the way to behave because that's how it had been for them. And perhaps they thought it made them feared. Personally, I didn't want to scare people into learning. If they didn't want to be there, they'd end up failing themselves without me shouting and screaming. I found it far more effective to use hum- humor and to be quiet at times when others would shout. Using that old old parents line of, I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. Just a look would be enough. They wanted the approval of those already wearing the green lid. And so if they saw that they had failed you, they'd double their efforts on the next task. No need for shouting or swearing. When you fill a void with swearing, it looks, rightly or wrongly, like it's down to lack of intelligence or to anger issues. Instructors were being assessed by their students just as much as the other way around. I always decided early on that I would have, that I would share in any punishment that I handed out. If I gave them press ups, then I'd get down in the mud and do them too. Not only did that earn their respect, but it gave them no excuse in their minds to feel hard done by. At the end of the course, those that earned the coveted berets would be serving alongside me. And so I wanted to treat them as my equals, even if I was in a position of authority, especially if I was in a position of authority. We needed each other, and that's the same whether you're on a training exercise, in combat, or attempting a world record. No person is an island. Yeah. Good, a great uh, attitude that I think a lot of people could use, you know, from a leader, not just instructor, but from just a leadership perspective. You know, that you, you think maybe you need to yell to get someone's respect. No, it doesn't. You actually lose respect when you act like that. You get done with that, and now you go to see the careers management officer, and he's asking you about what you want to do next. Now, did he, did he chime in about selection? Did about he, going sorry? to selection? Did he, is he the one that brought up you possibly going to selection? Or no, did you already have it in your mind? I, I had it in my mind. So he, he pulled me in. So the whole period of time now from joining 5-9 to where I was now, I was now a sergeant. I'd spent eight years in 5-9. And that's purely because of the recce troop, the all arms commander course. So normally in the, in the military, you spend three years and then you move on to another unit. And, you know, you progress in your mm-hmm. career. So to have eight years there and seven of them with brigade recce is unheard of. <laughs> so I, I basically had to move on. So I'd, I'd put my paperwork in for, for Pathfinders, which was the brigade recce for the airborne <laughs> unit. And we, we, each year we have a confidential report and my report was excellent and he pulled me in he said can you not see the wood through the trees he goes you need to go to then come back as the, the recce troop staff sergeant go in you know pathfinders isn't the way so he probably like yeah gave me a bit of a rollicking um but that afternoon actually um I got a phone call from Glasgow. Glasgow runs all our manning and records. They tell you where you're getting posted and things like that. And so the engineered, Royal Engineer Divers, we also have Royal Navy Search Divers. There have been a few deaths recently mm. in the Royal Navy Divers, um, just purely because they're not full-time divers and there's you know, lack of... Um, no, I would say lack of... Uh, protocol and Yeah, training. exactly. Yeah, protocol training. So there unfortunately been a couple of deaths. But then HSE had now started creeping into diving. You know, when I said, said earlier that there's no, no voice comms and things like that, now you can't dive unless you've got two-way visual camera and voice comms. So HSE was really creeping into military. So, wait, what's HSE? Health and safety executive. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, big, the big banners. So they'd introduced a new dive equipment called the Sabre Mod 1. Um, and uh, so it didn't disrupt 
the other diving courses they introduced another dive team to come in and train all the current divers within the engineers so i just passed my army diving supervisors and got top students so you know that that same day the sergeant majors like that having been merolic i then get posted to the dive school so it was out of both our hands um so i went down there as the the senior dive instructor um and then you're down there as a senior dive instructor and it sounds like you guys are basically just a uh, partying a lot because in the book, I mean, you guys are divers, but you kind of, it's fun. You're training people that are already divers, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you're just training them on a new piece of gear. That's it. Yeah. They're already qualified divers, but for them, they're, they're going to Portsmouth. It's like probably coming to San Diego. You know, yeah. you've got two weeks in the gas lamp, <laughs> you know, for these guys, they're, they're saving up their money. They're so they're ready to rock and roll. Yeah. But every two weeks you get another another course of qualified mm. divers. So for them, it was, it was a holiday. They knew that they knew they were passing. They were just going through the procedures. <laughs> so they're on holiday and they're dragging you on holiday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're coming out. And I, you know, I was a single guy, yeah, of course. <laughs> and at one point, at what point did you realize, did you decide you're gonna go selection? So uh, a couple of mates had gone uh, SAS and we, we met up about three months later. And, um, you know, it really opened my eyes and I, you know, I, I, I like to party hard and they were like, you're not even drunk. And, you know, I said, ah, I said I'm going to go on selection. And it was one of the back of, ah, no, you won't. I said, yeah, well, so that Monday I, I just stopped drinking mm -hmm. uh, and then, and then I trained. Um, I went on, I had an attempt at selection before that a couple of years before, not long after the all arms commander course and my knee blew out on the hill. How deep into selection were you on that first time when you got blown out knee? Within the aptitude phase, the first four weeks uh, on on the hill training, so I tore my uh, I tore my lateral meniscus. But my training for that selection, I was up and down the North Devon coastal path, mm -hmm. you know, carrying weight. I was just pounding and pounding the knee. So for me, I didn't want to have that same approach with this attempt. Also, I was running uh, dive courses at the time, so the only time I had, you know off was the evening so i'd spend two hours on on these spin bikes you know these spin bikes i'd yeah, just be yeah. on a spinner for, yeah. for two hours each night uh for six weeks uh, how was uh when you when you got dropped from selection the first time around like you're kind of making it like it's no big deal i only know from my experience it's a when you if if people don't make it through like basic seal training yeah it's a it's a it's horrible because you're going to be in the regular Navy and that's not what you join the Navy to do. And all of a sudden you're doing this other thing or you're doing like a regular Navy job and that's not good. And I can't even fathom mm -hmm. like my mindset if I wouldn't have made it, but it seems like it's a little easier on someone that's, you know, you're at, so you were, were you at five, nine? So I was in recce time? troop at the time. Yeah, yeah. So you're in recce troops. So you're like, okay, I didn't get through it this time and I still have an awesome job. Yeah. So maybe it wasn't quite as psychologically devastating. Yeah, well, we, we, you, you get two attempts at selection, you see. Got it. So I knew I had another attempt. It wasn't the be-all be -all or end-all, but I learned a lot from that. And it was, it was the, the approach to training. You know, a lot, you know, we have the first four weeks, which we'll talk about soon on selection, which is the aptitude phase, which is the hills phase, which is the physical. Once you're, at, once you're past that, it's, it's when the soldering uh, then comes in. And I sort of knew I just need to get past that first four weeks because soldiering-wise, you know, I spent – years in recce troop, mm -hmm. you know, I was on the all arms team, you know, I was, I was quite current. So when I approached, did it the second time, like I said, I, I was on the spinner bike for two weeks, so it was l low impact. And um, actually I'd, we'd do a, a run in the U UK ministry called BFT, the basic fitness test. It's a, it's a run for a mile and a half. Mm -hmm. And I got my fastest run at the age of 28. I did it in like seven minutes, 10 seconds. So I thought, right, you know, the fitness, fitness, fitness is up, up here. Um, so I then went on selection. I decided to, um, to go SBS. I went and did the, they do a thing called a briefing course because there's two attempts at selection. Mm -hmm. Days of old guys, you know, if you weren't from the Marines in Paris, guys would go on selection and get caught out. They'll they'd get big culture shock. They didn't realize actually what was involved and what training and preparation you needed to do. So rather than wasting one life, then coming back and mm -hmm. potentially getting injured, both units then introduced a thing called a briefing course, which you can have as many attempts at as you want. And it's a one week course. And basically it's like an aptitude. It gives you an insight of what where you are fitness wise, did navigation you, wise. Did you get to do that the first attempt that you did they didn't I have didn't, it yet they didn't have that yet so, so you had wasted one life so i'd wasted one <laughs> life yeah so i went and did the sas briefing course for a week 
And then the following week, I went and did the SBS one because I still wanted to, I mm. wanted, wanted to make my decision. But obviously, a lot of more of my friends were in the SAS, and I, I sort of knew all them, and you know, sort of the way that they operated. And then I went down to Paul in, in Dorset on our south coast, and then and the guys are there, you know, they've got frog shorts, t-shirts, they've got you know reef sandals and oak. I was like, yeah, this is me. This is this, this is where I, this is where I belong. Um, so I did both, and then you have to make the decision before you go on selection. So I said, right. I'm going SBS. And that was a new yeah. thing. Before, if you were in the Army, you're going to the SAS. If you were in the Marines, or That's I guess, would they take regular Navy dudes into the SBS? There's only ever been one Navy guy pass. Although it's the Naval Special Forces, right, right. Only, only one Navy guy's pass. It, up until then, it was 100% um, Royal Marines. So normally, you or in the past, you would have been SAS 100%, yeah. not even a choice. That's you're in the Army, you're going to the SAS. That's it. And at some point during the joint environment of hey we all need to work together yeah they said pick which one you want to go to you saw the you saw the you saw a pool you saw <laughs> flip flops and, yeah. and surf shorts and oakley's and said i'm i'm heading there yeah that was it the so what it was was the marines could go to the sas so the marine the sbs were losing candidates to the sas because mm. not everyone likes diving you see mm. oh yes. yeah and then some guys have head injuries as well it means they can't go underwater so they were losing uh, students to that and so they decided to then open up tri-service that the navy the army and the raf can come and they just literally just done that so for me having spent eight years in free commander brigade having the green beret anyway and being the sea and it was just seemed a natural transition the perfect transition for me but in my head I thought well if I go SAS you know because I'm a senior dive instructor I'm going to end up in boat troop if I go SBS these guys are all divers so you know I'm mm -hmm. level playing field and that was where my mindset was and so yeah I, I did it much to the disgust of my friends in the <laughs> SAS they're like what are you doing because especially like recce troop we had a hundred percent pass rate and it was like you know if this guy goes then you know people are going to look, look at those options um, you know, UK Special Forces, 40% of UK Special Forces made up of the Royal Marines. That's because they were all in, in the SBS. Hmm. You you uh, had to explain this a lot. Here's the, here's the book. Uh, talking to your instructors, why the fuck do you want to go to pool? One of the DSs asked me, the Special Forces selection encompassed all of those who wanted to go to SAS and SBS. So it's the exact same training. You're going to go through the exact same training, the, the exact same selection course, I should say. I knew I shouldn't give him a real answer. I didn't want to go to boat troop in Hereford, and I liked the way the SBS guys cut about in t-shirts, shorts, and Oakleys. As a surfer, that appealed to me, and pool would certainly put me closer to the surf spots of Devon and Cornwall. I love diving, staff. Shit answer, who likes diving? The DS snorted picking up a rock. Put that in your kit, and you better fucking have it when, we're, when we get to the end of the day. I had it with me every day. Each morning the DS would ask me the same question and each day I'd be told to put a rock into my already heavy Bergen. Then one day I had an idea. My chances of being the gray man were long gone. And so I decided to p deploy a bit of humor. Back in the camp that evening I got busy and in the morning I was prepared. One, two of the D DS walked over to me. They were both from Hereford and both had been at 5'9". They had a keen eye for horrible rocks. Oi, you! Why the fuck you want to go to pool? I placed my weapon down across my boots so that it was out of the dirt and opened up the one of the map pockets in my trousers, pulling out a laminated photo. What the fuck is this? One of them sneered. It was a fold it was a photo of Bournemouth. Am I saying that right? Bournemouth, yeah. Bournemouth. <laughs> Bournemouth. God, I'm an American. <laughs> it was a it was a photo of Bournemouth Beach during a heat wave. I'd pulled it off of Google and laminated it in the office. You don't get topless girl, girls on the beach in Hereford, staff. I told them with a straight face, and both men burst out laughing. I kept the photo in my pocket for the rest of the course and didn't carry another rock. <laughs> uh, actually, one of the main reasons why I, well, I, I grew up surfing too yeah. in, in cold, the cold water of New England, and I was looking at, you know, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to go into, and one of the things that was seemed like a really good deal was either being stationed in Virginia Beach, which is good waves on the East Coast, and or San Diego, which yeah. is San Diego. And either that, you know, or you go into Fort Bedding or Fort Lewis <laughs> or you know, just there's some other places to get stationed. So that definitely helped guide me in the right direction. Now I didn't know any SEALs at the time. Otherwise I would have seen 
sandals, shorts, and Oakleys, and yeah. that probably would have steered me even more in that direction. Um, you continue on here. Despite the rocks, I did really well on the hills. The training on the spin bike worked out. My joints felt fresh. On my last basic fitness test at dive school, I even ran my fastest time ever, 28 years old. Avoiding injury on the hills is key. There's no time for recovery. If you get hurt, you're done. That's that. And so I was pleased that I'd learned the lessons of my first attempt at selection and adapted my plan accordingly. Yeah, my buddy John Dudley, he's a bow hunter and like he's he spends a bunch of time on the stationary bike getting ready for hunting season. And I I was like I just put on a ruck and walk because I'm maybe not as smart. Um, but yeah, it seems like that's a seems like that works. Yeah, I, th- I think obviously you're gonna have the impact anyway. You know, for for me when I did the first selection, you know, I've got quite big hill legs, so actually ascending hills w- was not a problem. Where you need to be making up your time is on the on the downhills and on the straights, and you know, and that's where I need needed to improve. So mm-hmm. that's that's why I introduced the, the spin bike because I didn't want to inflame that injury again i didn't want to you know put start in a, in a bad position so i just looked at what worked and what didn't you know i knew i was str- I, I had the strength you know for the, in, in my legs i just didn't have the speed and how was i going to be able to improve on that and that's where the spinning bike was, was was perfect for it but the our, our aptitude our first four weeks is you know it's 20 20 to 30 kilometers you know up to 70 pounds uh, you you have then then have like the test week um, and they say you know you need to be moving at 4k an hour which thinks that's fine but that's as the crow flies looking at a map mm. so if you've got a mountain <laughs> in the way <laughs> you need to get over that mountain so you need to really be moving about 5 to 6k an hour because if you have, then have any issues navigational wise you know you, you've got some fudge and, and you, you're not scraping in but Groundhog Day for four weeks doing that on the uh, Brecon Beacons in, in Wales is uh and you don't know, there's no like cutoff time. They just tell you to go and get it done as quick as you can. Basically. That's it. Yeah, you, you basically get to your, your, your start point. You know, the DS will give you your grid reference. You, you then step aside, work out, you know, which direction you're going. Tell him in time, speed, distance, and you're sort of working on your, your 4K an hour, how long it's going to take you. And, and then you go. I mean, you get to the next checkpoint, which is the top of the hill, where he's always meet the DS, tell him to pick up a rock. And then they will just give you the next one. And you just keep going until you get to, to the finish point. And they also have a couple of little games in there as well where you, f- you think you've finished for the day. Mm-hmm. And they're like, ah, right, your next checkpoint. Um, and then, you, you know, you go, you start going. And it caught a couple of guys out. They were, like, ah, they were done. And didn't realize, actually, it was, ju- it was just a test. Um, you did just have to be self-disciplined, you know, self-motivated. Yeah. No, you wrote, the, you wrote about that in the book, how they'd come up, you think you're done. Yeah. You've been walking for what, 12 hours, 14 hours or whatever it is, 19th day in a row. Yeah. You come up to the to the drill sergeant and you say, um, you know, him checking in and he's like, yep, here's your next point. Yeah. And guys would say, I'm done. And they'd quit. Yeah. And then someone else would come up and say, they'd say, here's your next point. And they'd start walking and say, hey, just kidding, come back. And then that guy would realize that they just quit for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was on ours. It was a lot of the, the para lads. A lot of the parachute regiment lads would go as drivers to drive the vehicles on the selections before, so they knew the start and finishes points, and it was actually to catch them out because in their head they're like, right, I've oh. just got thirty kilometers. I've just got thirty kilometers, and so they built themselves up. And when they get to that point, they think it's finished. And then when you throw a little curveball in there, they're like, they weren't expecting it. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, yeah, then test week, you know. It, it, it's called the aptitude phase, but test week itself, you then have five marches. And if you don't come in on the times, you know, you get, you get a red card, you get two red cards, uh, you're done. I think the first three marches are about 30 kilometers. The fourth march is, is 35 kilometers, but then you have four hours rest. And then that evening you do 40 miles mm-hmm. uh, with 70 pounds. It's called endurance. And you have to do that within 20 hours. It's called other things besides endurance. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, but you finish that and you think, brilliant. You know, I've, I've just passed the hills phase. It's, it's quite a big thing. But for the instructors, they call it aptitude. They don't even call you by your, your name. Mm-hmm. They don't even know who you are at this point. It's like, and you probably lost 50% of the course at this point. Either voluntary withdrawal, mm-hmm. injury, mm-hmm. Or, or actually just not meeting the, yeah, the grade. Injury level's got to be high. Yeah. Because that's a beat down on your joints. Oh, I no. mean, well, it happened to you the first time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean obviously, 
like I, I, I broke my ankle as a young boy. So my, so my nemesis in the military was my, my left ankle. And so it would go Should over. Wait, we, can, we can edit that out. We don't want everyone to know his weaknesses. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, though, I knew that. And I, I would tape, you know, I'd tape my ankles up and things like that. And I remember on test week, um, I had these, these military boots lowers, had great ankle support. Because, you know, because lads were, were failing, they were, they were leaving. So in the evening, you'd, you'd, you'd put your boots in the drying room. And I remember going in the next day and I'm like, ah, they look a bit small. And one of the guys who'd left had taken my boots. And I was like, oh, no. And I still had about three more test marches with these, with these almost like jungle boot style <laughs> boots, you know, running across all these babies' heads. So, uh, yeah, but, you know, it's also administering yourself and looking after yourself and prevention. Um. You continue on, you get past that that phase, and like you, you say in here, like that was just the beginning. Um, and you, you also say this, you had to be totally self-motivated. You either had the yeah. mental strength or you didn't. Unlike P Company or Commando Course, there were no shouts of encouragement from the staff. Anything the DS did say would be an attempt to undermine your confidence and make you second guess yourself. Yeah. My preparation for the course helped a lot. I never doubted my decisions. I knew uh, I'd done the work over the years to be spot on with my map and compass. I knew I'd left enough sweat in the gym to have my fitness up to standard. I'm only human, and I'd listen to the DS's cutting criticism, but then I could calmly say to myself, it's just part of the mind games, mate. You're doing fine. Times like those, I'd think back to when my dad had told me I wouldn't last two minutes in the army. He'd been wrong, and so would the DS. <laughs> yeah, they, play, they, they learn what to say to people. Yeah. To get them to quit, yeah. you know, they they say all kinds of things. And what you would you say right there? Uh, it's just part of the mind games. Yeah, but man, they go hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they do. Yeah, we, we 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 go to the jungle. So when, once we finish the hills phase, we we start doing some uh, some infantry skills as well. Because basically, you, you're learning all over again. So whether you're a marine or para, the way that they operate in UKSF is totally different. And you're introducing new weapon systems. So the C8 DeMarco is only used by UK Special Forces. You're having to learn a whole new weapon system mm. uh, again. And um, yeah, but you know from your friends who've done it before you that they're going to start playing mind games with you. And I remember we go to Brunei, spend six weeks in the jungle, and that's, that's a great, great part of selection. You lose a lot of guys there. You know, some guys really thrive in the jungle, and some guys it's almost like... Um, it's claustrophobic, mm -hmm. you know, you, you spend a lot of time in there day in, day out, and you hear the helicopter coming in to pick up the lads, and you see guys, you just see guys randomly packing their bags, you're like, Jesus, and they're like, what are you doing? They said, oh, well, you know, I'm going to fail this, the instructor said, yeah, I was like, ignore what the instructor said. <laughs> but I remember when it happened to me, I remember we, we were marching up to a, um, a range, and everything we do on selection is live firing, we don't do blank, everything is for real, um, you know, because on a day of the race you don't fire blank and it's all about weapon handling that you're, you're safe but you know effective and I remember one instructor's coming straight up to me fucking in my face screaming and shouting he's like if I see any weapon handling like that again he goes you'll be off you'll be on the next helicopter and I just said yes yeah, stuff um, I didn't get into an argument I hadn't even been on the range yet he didn't realise that you know I hadn't even been on the range so I knew it was my day uh, that he was testing me and you, you could see it as well you know throughout the course you can see oh he's getting it today because the instructors would be on you I mean you, you get guys that, you know who don't pass and they said oh yes could I had a personality clash with mm -hmm. the instructors and, and a lot of them tend to use that but what they do on selection which is, which is great is actually especially with the final exercise the last 10 days they swap your instructors around so if there is, you know, human beings, there's always going to be personality clashes. If there is anything like that, it's sort of you get you, you get a fair chance at it. So, um, but I enjoyed I enjoyed the the, the jungle for me. Um, you know, I, I was going through a, a court case at the time, my ex wife, and trying to get custody of my 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 first daughter. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember passing, and we have a barbecue. And they always say, don't go on selection with any welfare issues. You need to go there fully focused. You know, so guys, guys would get letters from their wives, you know, blueies. And she's having a bad day. You know, if she's at home with a free. Would you call it a bluey? Bluey. It used to be like blue, uh, blue envelopes, which are free, free post. Got it. Um, and, you know, you write in there and it's, it's purely just military. So it's, it's known as a bluey. And, you know, if your wife's having a bad day and she's got the kids and mm. she thinks you're on holiday in Brunei, you know mm. what I mean? Um, <laughs> and she's like, Ugh. I mean, he, you know, it plays with your mind. And mm. guys pull themselves off and then phone their wives and are like, oh, I'm actually all right now. You know what I mean? So they do say, 
just cut off all the white noise. Mm-hmm. So when I finished, my uh, my chief instructor's like, he goes, oh yeah, guys, come on here, we're well fit. I said, I'm going through a divorce <laughs> and, and custody of my kid. He said, really? I said, it's the only place the solicitors can't get letters to me. And, and, and that's what I mean. So for me at the time, it was a, it was a big escape. Escape, bro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just I got back and it was a big pile of letters. That are great. But, um, but yeah, you, you come back from that and... I, I, I got the, uh, the troop sergeant role for the final five days of the, of the final attack. And you saw that's almost an indicator that you're, you're doing well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I sort of I knew I, I'd done well on the course. But when you come out of the jungle, you have the barbecue, the instructors get together, they have their little you know, final decisions. But you don't know for another five days when you get back to UK. They don't, they don't tell you there and then. It's like, so, you know, one of the instructors came up to me at the barbecue, a friend of a friend, a uh, South African lad, drunk, totally drunk. He said, oh, yeah, you've done well. He said, but you should come SAS. So it's almost like you've been given the nod unofficially. And so you're telling lads, like, have you been given a nod? Yeah, I, oh, I haven't. So lads are self-critiquing oh, over the God. next five days. And, and, and a member, the, the same DS came up to me the next day. So he said, Stoy. He said, did I give you the nod last night? I said, no, he said, did you pass? I said, I don't know. You said I did. He said, oh, drunk uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, i was gonna say that's like psychological yeah, all yeah, kinds yeah, of psychological games hey it's been nice knowing you've really, really made good effort out here it's like <laughs> yeah, mm. yeah. But, but but actually the the, the jungle drums it's, it's quite a big thing selection you know those instructors who go back they'll sort of tell things it doesn't take long before it starts so i got a text of my friend's wife saying well done i've hey, you've passed how does his wife know <laughs> in devon that i've passed but even though you, you, you you're feeling confident that you've done it you still you still when you walk in five days later it's like you know because occasionally guys are getting the, the down check because yeah. whatever yeah that's it you know they, they may have got through the jungle phase but it may be like you know not, not not this time but with the jungle you only get one attempt so mm. that, that, that that's your only attempt so, so yeah that's a that's quite a big big color as well but once you finish the jungle phase you know that they want you you know, so the next three months, you know, unless you're a real, you know, do a Neil Diamond negligent, negligent discharge or something like that, you're, you, 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 sh- you should be safe. And what's the last three months? What are you doing for that section? So you do continuation training, so you do SEER, survival evasion, resistance extraction, uh, running through grey coats around the Scottish Highlands. Mm-hmm. Um, you do your, your parachute and your squares. You do your communications kit. And then the final phase, the counterterrorism. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, they, they they get you into a position that when you join your saber squadron, that you can fit into the team. Mm-hmm. But you're, you're, that's just your start point within the squadrons. But so it's a six month process. It's it's actually quite long drawn out. And we we basically the SBS and SAS, as you touched on, is, is joint selection. Mm-hmm. And the accommodations at Hereford with the SAS, and you're seeing the guys on the course already being given know what squadron they're going to told what deployments they're going having to go see the quartermaster to get kit and you guys in the sbs are like oh my god you know not getting anything um so it is quite frustrating that they get their berry and belt and then we used to just get given a blue tracksuit you got then another three months continuation oh it's it's it continues on it, it does to is the it SBS. still selection or is it just continuation it's days of old it used to be selection because if you failed the dive course they'd accept you in the sas uh, so, you know the whole thing you know what's the difference between the SES and the SBS I always say surprisingly average soldier slightly better soldier you know sort of joking but um, <laughs> you know but but actually they then introduced that we then got we then got our own sort of unit recognition we got our own cat badge recently and you know we got our own belt because days of old you wouldn't know who was SBS because mm-hmm. it was a Royal Marine cat badge that was it yeah the only indicator was this, his long curly hair <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, you go here an elite club it may have been and the journey to get there was incredibly difficult but all of the other men at the squadron I now joined had done exactly the same so no one remarked on it for me selection had been the most monumental thing in my life but for these guys it was a tick in the box to get me to work you the new guy are you all right, simple as that. I'd be the, the exactly the same way once I'd spent some time at pool and the next cadre of new guys came in, but for now, I was the new bloke and I was about to begin one of the most intense periods of my life. What year is this? So this is 2006. Oh, okay, so yeah. it's on. 
So when, wh- where were you when September 11th happened? So September 11th, I we were about to go on a uh, an exercise called Safe Surreal in Oman. It was a big a mm-hmm. big exercise. And I remember obviously seeing the Twin Towers, you know, getting pulled into the cinema, watching it. And then that um, that afternoon, I got a phone call from the, the dive school saying that, you know, there's an army advanced diving course started yesterday. Yesterday, one of the guys has failed his his entrance test. So our diving courses are in, in phases. You have your mm-hmm. basic course, which is um, which is six weeks. You had advanced course, which is 10, and you, you supervise it. So you have to pass each before you, you progress. And so I got a phone call to, to come down to dive school. So I was heading down the road and then obviously see the Twin Towers. Everyone's going to Oman. I think, oh my God, I'm going to miss out uh, on this. And, uh, you know, so I missed the initial the initial phases of that. And then I was at Limston on the training team when the lads lads deployed. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I missed out with Free Commander Brigade, my <laughs> Afghan tour. So I was f- fuming, fuming. So my, my first deployment in Afghan was the S- with the SPS. Uh, you say here... Um I totally understand that some people will be disappointed that I can't divulge details of special forces operations, but our country has enemies and we can't hand them information that could endanger the lives of my former colleagues who continue to operate around the world, selflessly providing the blanket of freedom beneath which we sleep. I know you'll appreciate that, and in light of what they sacrifice, we can sacrifice some stories. Let me just say that those years gave me some of my best friends and that I love the job. So this is now, you're, you're going on deployments, um, with the SBS, and obviously we're not going to go into any, any any details of them. Were you guys primarily doing like direct action? Yeah. So when we, I was very fortunate. My first, you know, I'd missed that opportunity with Free Commander Brigade. So when I went out with the SBS, um, my first our first deployment was the first ever operational jump for the SBS into mm. into Helmand. So I was like, wow, it's my first time in Afghan, and it's an operational jump at, at night. Um, so yeah, we we were doing it's called Task Force Forty Two mm-hmm. TF Forty Two, which is the door kicking, but also alongside that, um, the intelligence services were also picking up agents and things mm-hmm. like that. So I was having to work between between both. Normally, the instru- the guys who were going that were from our reservists and they'd all failed the course. <laughs> so when I first got there, it was literally door kicking mm-hmm. at night and then in the day dressing up as a local. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, we, we then did numerous operational jumps. We were very fortunate on that tour. We had the most HVTs than any squadron and we had more HVTs in the first three months than the last three squadrons back to back mm. um, because we were just changing the way that that we operated as, as you know out there you, you had to change mm-hmm. you know they all knew your TTPs and you had to ch- change and adapt to that so for me I was, I was at the pinnacle you know I'd, I'd missed out that time with free commander ago but I, I, I made up for it in abundance and what's your position are you, are you like a breacher are you a sniper what's your what's your role yeah, so actually one thing I forgot to mention, so un- unlike, um, so when I went on selection, I was a sergeant. When you finish selection, your rank goes, you start again. As a trooper. As a trooper. Yeah, well, actually, they, they said I was going to be a Marine. I was like, whoa. And I said, I said, that's fine, but know that no other army lad, especially airborne, is going to come in to SBS if you call us Marines. You have to call us troopers. So when I went there, I was almost like the guinea pig. You know what works, what doesn't work, and, and and things like that. So yeah, but then you do. You, Were you literally the first army? There was two two other guys with uh, two other guys with me. There was an officer and another engineer lad in your selection class. Yeah, and so you three were the first army soldiers to go into the I SPS. think there was one before there was one be, one before us but uh, first time in in, the, in this squadron mm-hmm. but from the engineers especially recce troop being the, being the first and I think now 15% of the SPS is now made up of the army so it was almost like the floodgates uh, had opened um, which I think is good because the marines as I said they're so proud of you know their background and things like that but you need diversity mm-hmm. you need diversity in there and that's what the army the army brought in also, the fact that at the time the SAS were running Iraq mm-hmm. and the SBS were running Afghan. Mm-hmm. So again, you know, if the guys want to go on selection, you know, Iraq was starting to wind down. You know, guys were looking yeah. uh, towards Afghan. So the SBS was a good option there. Yeah, that, I, that's my interaction with. Well, I had two interactions with the with the British special forces in my career. One of them was before nine eleven, and um, it was it was it was very cool. And I'll tell you about it later. And then the other one was, um, it was, it was just in, in, in Iraq, you know, we were hitting target sets and there was, 
like multiple targets that were all somehow connected. And so I just sat down next to the troop commander and we walked, talked through the plan and really good guy. And obviously just, you know, when people ask me about the, the Brits, and I, I, I've worked with other British units, but all of them, what I say about the Brits, the British are just professionals, like yeah. just professionals, the way they behave, the way they operate. It's just always awesome. You know they're going to be squared away. It's um, That was always my impression of, of the British special forces and of the British military in general. Yeah. Except for one person that I'll tell you, also tell you about later, <laughs> which was really strange, and he was British Navy. So, oh, really? uh, which is strange, right? Because that's the Royal Navy. That's the Royal Navy, yeah. Right. Yeah. We should be just totally squared away. Yeah. Well, that's probably where the drinking, <laughs> drinking uh, problems are. Uh, yeah. This guy was. Uh, I don't know. Maybe he could have used a beer at this particular <laughs> individual. Uh, so you. So I cut you off when you were talking about. I'd asked you, were you a sniper? Or? Yeah. Yeah. So when you, when you join, um, it depends. So we have four troops. Um, so you have air, mountain, boat, m- and mobility. I mean, you go in there, and as I said, when you when you pass selection, you think oh, I've just done six months. You know, you're at the the baseline. You're at now another baseline, and you have to then get all these other skill sets. So within the teams, it's where there's any gaps. So whether it's language demolitions, you know, I was I was the forward air controller, so mine was anything to do with air uh, was me. So I was I was the FAC within ours, and then that means you get to go on every mission. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, perfect. But then you obviously stacking up on the doors, you know, you would be point man. You know, there's guys out there who've got books like first man in, I'm the leader. Well, you're not. You know, the first man in is, is the new boy. You know, the, the, the section commander or the commander is like number three or four. So, but then obviously when you bounce on to the next door, it just depends who was there. You know, that's what we used to do. You know, we didn't really have to say, right, we have to go in this order. Mm-hmm. You know, when we did our training, it was unrelenting. You know, we, we knew it inside out, the drills. It was just second nature, mm-hmm. very slick. So, uh, but you were, so you are just, you guys are doing a, a rolling point. Doesn't matter who goes in, but did you, did you guys have breacher? Did you have special assignment for that? Because you were an engineer. I figured you were going to say breacher because we always kind of associate breacher with engineer. Was that a no? Yeah, no, it wasn't actually. When I, when I, yeah, so out there, no, it, no, it wasn't because because their demolitions is, is slightly different from the Royal Engineer demolitions. Like, no, we'll, we'll take down the bridge, <laughs> not, not put a nice little hole in it. You know, we'd probably drop the whole compound. <laughs> uh, things they like. didn't trust you to be a breacher. No. You'd be too, using too much explosives. <laughs> <laughs> but what they tend to do, which I thought was great in the special forces, if you already have skill sets, is you've already you've already got that skill set. Let's give you another skill set, you know. So you sort of build on it. So like the Pathfinder lads, who like the airborne recce, when they go SAS, they're already halo trained. Mm-hmm. So there's no point in them going air troop. They've got that skill set. Put them in boat troop, you know. Oh, so they try and give smart. you as many skill sets as possible. Yeah. And then how long would you guys go on deployments for? So ours is six months, six month deployment. We used to do a two year sort of rule month. So six months uh, pre-deployment training, six months training, you, you then come back and then you're on the green roll. So mm-hmm. you're on the page for any sort of, any other um, situations around the world. And then six months counter-terrorism then. So hostage rescue mm-hmm. in, you know, domestic and international. And then, um, <clears throat> When you, uh, like like I said, I think that's enough broad, people can kind of figure out what you were doing. Um, but how long, how many years of this cycle were you on? So this cycle, this cycle would every every two years. So every two years you'd be out for, for, for another six months. Mm-hmm. Uh, unless you then, you spend four years in your Sabre squadron and then you, you have to move on. You then get like an instructional post. Oh, okay. uh, so guys tend to do that and then they, they then come back in and slot in as then team leaders. And then go through the whole room on again. So now we're going to jump into one particular pre-deployment training cycle. I'm going to the book. We were in the desert as part of our pre-deployment training. I couldn't wait to get back out on operations, nor could any of the other guys. Being on ops was the reason we joined the special forces, and nowhere were our skills put to the test more than the daily life or death battles with our enemies. We're going on high altitude, high opening training. I loved jumping. Jumping. Some guys didn't and just sucked it up, but I always wanted to be the first in the stick so I could stand on the open tail ramp and look down at the earth beneath me. I wanted to soak it all in before I jumped, but on the second jump that day, I was put in the back of the line. I waddled with my kit toward the door as the others left the aircraft. One guy tumbled out after the next. Eventually, it was my turn, I jumped. And immediately, I knew that I was in trouble. I felt something on my leg. I looked up and saw that it was wrapped in rigging. 
I knew that as soon as the static line pulled up the canopy, that rigging would shoot up above my head and the force of it would take my leg with it. I had a second to get my leg clear. Whack. I failed. The static line pulled the chute. The chute pulled the rigging. The rigging pulled my leg. It came up and over my shoulder like I was a yoga guru. Instantly, I felt every muscle, ligament, and tendon rip and snap. I screamed in absolute agony and almost blacked out from the pain. The rigging worked its way clear, and now the leg fell back alongside the other, but I knew that I had no control over its movement. I was lucky to still have the leg. The force could have easily ripped it off, and if that happened, I'd have bled to death within minutes, and some poor local would have had a one-legged corpse landing in his garden. Pain was racing through my body, but I knew that if I didn't get my act together, I could still die. I was so far up that oxygen was thin and I could not afford to pass out. I drifted away from my guys. If I drifted away from my guys, I could end up in the middle of the desert or the sea. It would be browners. I had to stay awake. You'd think that the pain would have made that easy, but it was so intense that my brain was trying to send me into unconsciousness. I wouldn't let it. I just wouldn't. Instead, I fixed my focus on the descending parachutes of the stick and followed them in. It was the longest 30 minutes of my life. Despite the physical agony, I had time, had enough time hanging in the sky to feel emotional pain too. I knew that there would be no deployment for me now. I think I knew deep down that there would be no more time on operations at all. 30 minutes is a long time to think about that when you're alone floating through the air. Finally, the ground was getting closer. I saw my mates landing in formation. I wanted to make a good landing out of pride, but more than that, I knew that if I landed badly, I could quite well ruin my good leg too. The ground came up to meet me. I pushed down on my toggles and flared the chute just at the right moment, dragging in enough air under the canvas to take the speed out of my descent. If you do it too early, you just stop in the sky, then drop like a sack of shit, but I came in like a feather and landed on one leg. There was only one thing left to do. Medic. What year was that? So that was 2010. So, man, um, that's it. I mean, your leg, did you know instantly you you were done? Yeah, um, you know, it was actually the new guys who come to the squadron were getting hey ho trained. So our sergeant major was like, we'd already brought a hey ho trained from previous tours. He's like, well, go do fun jumps. You know, I'd like jumping, but there's no such thing as a fun jump in the military. <laughs> and um, the reason I got moved, I, normally I'm at the front, I like to frog. You know, mm-hmm. so you, ex- you turn around mm-hmm. and you exit the PGIs, which used to always upset the, uh, the, the RAF. <laughs> so I then got moved to the back of the stick. And like I said, we'd done numerous of these jumps just routine but as I exit it got caught in the line so I'm you know, kick, trying to kick it in time and I, and I couldn't and then when it got pulled up and over you know you probably hear me from the ground uh, screaming so but no one else in the team is aware mm-hmm. that there's anything, anything going on um, but because of those thin altitude I was drifting in and out the, I was vomiting because of the pain and I just needed to get I just wanted to get to the ground and see and re-establish what's, what's going on um, assessed the other parachutists, their approach, you know, took another uh, look over the DZ and, and landed it one legged, but you no, know, straight away, I couldn't put any pressure on it, you know. Got, got, uh, we got um, medic, medic uh, back to the camp, uh, had a MRI scan the next day, and they was like, Yeah, you've torn your ACL, your MCL, your lateral meniscus, your hamstring, your calf, your quad, so all the supporting muscles as well. So, normally with an ACL or MCL, you you can carry on. You see rugby players mm-hmm. just carrying on, but it was all the supporting muscles. But to add to the issue as well, the it was the Icelandic volcano which grounded aircraft all over the world, so they couldn't get an aeromed to me. So basically, I was just thrown into a hotel in Muscat. The lads went on to tour from there. Mm-hmm. I was put in a hotel for four weeks with painkillers, you know, sort of deteriorating. Got back to UK after an aeromed. Uh, sent home for sort of six weeks back to the hospital and they'd lost all my paperwork and it was just a spiral of of errors within the military medical system and how long did it take for you to get through i mean how long did it take to get surgery and you talk about it in the book but how long was that it was 44 weeks in the end you know my when i injured my leg on the first selection process it was five days and then i was running again in six weeks it took me 44 weeks 
to get this. So, you know, my whole, my leg had deteriorated completely. And and for me, I was then transitioning to civilian street. So I wasn't really focused on my, my, my rehab. It was like, what am I going to do next? Did your, uh, at what point did, did you know, did somebody say, hey, that's it? You, you can't be here anymore? Did they offer you medical retirement? Like, what did that process look like? You'd like to think they'd offer you medical retirement, um, but it didn't. You know, I, I had to almost threaten them that I, I needed, um, uh, with legal, that I needed the operation. And when I left, they, the pay scale they, they put me out on was one below a medical pension. And it said you were fixed within 26 weeks. I was like, well, I was, it was 44 weeks. So five years later, I, I had a tribunal hearing against the military. And what the military tend to do is, is basically guys that appeal it, they'll say no, and you can appeal it again, and they'll say no. They'll lose 80% of people mm -hmm. doing that. So I knew a general who said to me, he said, just keep appealing. He said, they won't even open your case until it's the third appeal which was five years later. So that's what I did. And then I had a tribunal hearing in, in Edinburgh. And I went down and actually you had a QC in front of you and two doctors uh, from the military. I then brought a military charity in called the Royal British Legion. And they just sort of ask certain questions which mm -hmm. gets your story out. I and mean, then you have a representative from the military veterans you know, appealing you. And normally they can be quite aggressive but this guy was actually quite quite relaxed um but someone did say to me the week before he said look when you go in this th he go he he had one and he, he didn't get his medical pension he said when you go in there you can't be dean stop special forces you know if these guys say can you walk down the street you say no you know it, it was one of them so i sort of had that in the back of my mind and uh, i went in and actually they had the timeline that i'd printed out and um you know i, I ended, ended up getting a, a full full medical pension and then backdated but mm. the fact that I had to go through it yeah, with my own, yeah, it, it's crazy. So you like to think, you know, especially when you feel like you're the top again, you feel like you're a pop star within, you know, tier one special forces. And then just to sort of it almost put a a cloud over my, my career. Mm -hmm. you know, not my career, but the, the, my last last year in the military. Yeah, it's a bad, t it leaves you with a bad taste in your it mouth. leaves me with a bad taste. And I didn't actually realize until I was successful. How, you know, what a weight it was on my shoulders. You know, when I felt, when I got it, I felt I'd been reciprocated for my time, mm -hmm. you know, things. And I could almost close that chapter and move on, but that was five years after leaving. How many years then did you, how many years were you in total? 16. So 16 years in, and so you get, what from the day you got injured, what, how long did it take before you said, all right, I need, I'm going to get out because I can't do my job anymore? So, was, so ne it was over nearly a year and I had to extend because I hadn't even been operated on. You know, the military have to return you to civilian street in similar condition or best condition <laughs> from what you entered. And I, I was nowhere near that. So, so for me, my mindset, you know, my head's now thinking, well, I'm not, I'm not in the military anymore. I need to look, look beyond that, but you still can't progress because mm -hmm. you're waiting on, on this operation. So I, I, I got it in the end and then, and then I finally left in May 2011 is when I actually got out. And then as you're working through this transition, um, at some point you get a call. It's, uh, can you be in Libya tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So to add to the pressure, you know, you know, when, you know, we talk about identity crisis, you spent all this time in the military working in a tiny knit unit, you know, knowing what you're doing day out, working alongside professionals to like, where do I now fit in society? What is my role? What is my purpose? So I had that going on in, in my head. I hadn't really had that full transition. So guys, when they're getting out, they have like two year build up. you know, to do all these workshops and mm. they set up their companies. Mine was almost, you know, crash bang, you're, you're out the door. My wife at this point was eight months pregnant. You know, so I'm like, my God, is there any work out there? You know, what am I gonna do? And without sounding like Liam Neeson, people with our, our skill sets tends to be the private security industry. So this was the middle of the Arab Spring and Gaddafi was still in Tripoli at this point. And in Benghazi, a lot of the oil companies, the security companies, the media were, were forming up. And my friend who was a director, one of the large security companies said, Dean, can you be in Libya? And I said, yeah, of course I can. So I went, I went straight in and basically it was, a, it was a DFID project, Department for Institute Development, which was the, you know, at the time was the prime minister's little baby. So. They would go into the, these sort of countries and you'd have representatives from the, the financial sector, from the, the medical and, you know, mm -hmm. the military. And it's to basically advise and help these these countries get back on their feet. Uh, 
so they're all preparing for, for Gaddafi. So I, he said, can you go in? Can you help set up the DFID project? We're going to fly 30 um, private security operators in from Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. So I went in and straight away, I could see there was no threat. You know, the Libyans were, were very hospitable, mm. but they also were quite adamant that they didn't want this being another Afghanistan mm. and Iraq. You know, once Gaddafi had fallen, they wanted to take control of their country. They didn't want, you know, private security. So we had these MP7s, these, these weapons, and these guys came in two days later from this Herc, you know, these Herc from <laughs> Afghan and Iraq, and like, where's our weapons? And I, I sort of, sort of changing their mindset that actually there is no threat and mm -hmm. you know it needs to be all all low key um i was also trying to find a niche within the industry you know i was looking at all these other security companies a lot of my friends had their their security companies were doing uh anti-piracy mm -hmm. off the east coast of uh, africa so mm -hmm. i didn't want to tread on their feet so some of these big security companies I identified were charging you know, like six-figure sums for crisis management and evacuation plans. But when you scrape the surface, there was nothing in place. So having spent two weeks set that up, I, um, I flew back home and, and Alana gave birth to our daughter Molly. And um, I said, I think I've got a, a plan. <laughs> so I, I, I went back in to Libya and... and there was a huge proliferation of weapons at the time. There's mm -hmm. actually ammunition that was difficult to get hold of. So I bought 30 weapons on the black market and I buried them between Tunis and Egypt. And I just spent a month in the desert just cashing these pelly cases with comms kits and money and just wrote my own evacuation plans, hoping never to really, really need them. And, and that's what I did. We lived in Aberdeen, which is the oil and gas capital mm -hmm. of Europe. So I had a good links to the oil and gas sector. And that's what I did. I then, that was my niche. I'd, I'd found a niche within within the industry. Um, so yeah. That. Now, did you set that up where you were talking to the oil companies? And I've been to Aberdeen, mm. thankfully. <laughs> uh, very cool. So have you ever surfed there? I, I haven't, no, but I know up, up Thurso, further north is one of the great spots. I was there in like it's the winter and you could have surfed it. Like it wouldn't have been fun, but it, you could have surfed. I was looking at the waves. I went for a little run down there and I, I was looking at the waves and I was like, well, you could do it. Yeah. You could do it. But what would make it not fun? Bro, it was it's freezing, choppy. choppy. It was like barely, you could probably surf for about, yeah. you know, two seconds or three seconds per wave. You'd have the waves to yourself, though. There was no one in the water. <laughs> there was no one even on the beach. Um, so did you did you set that the, those all, all that gear up and then go and pitch to clients like, hey, I've got these plans set up. And here's what I can do for you. And then are they giving you some kind of a revenue up front? Yeah, so, it's, so basically I, I identified that I'd, I'd wrote him up first, you know, because it's almost like, right, I, I have this plan in, in place, you know, I had uh, the caches. So my sort of mindset with it was I, I knew that the Libyans didn't want security companies with weapons. So before long, we, we couldn't do that. So my sort of mindset was if there was a situation, we could drive across the border unarmed, you know, go to the cage points, pick them up if we needed, if we needed weapons, mm. you know, and then, and then get, you know, the client out and then, and then bury him. That, that was it. So... It was almost like a retainer, knowing that that, that service mm -hmm. was there. Um, and then we, we used to, I used to have like like triggers, you know. You know, if there's a certain situation, mm -hmm. we go up to yellow, we go up to amber. So really, you should never, if if, if you're adhering to that trigger system that you have in place, you shouldn't really need to go full right. on evacuation. Right. The only thing that sort of is is natural disasters. That's mm -hmm. where you can go from green to red overnight. Is, is a natural disaster. Yeah. So really, if you if you have that in place, but that's something I just picked up from the military. Um, was was these cage systems and these cage systems actually was um, the IRA and and the Taliban use these cage systems. That's where it originates. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, it just wasn't. I was walking around with weapons, but I knew that I had safe houses and I knew that there were weapons available if needed. Mm -hmm. And you built relationships, and you talk about that a lot in here. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I sort of, you know, I when I got out as well, I didn't want to be going out to Afghanistan and, and Iraq. You know, I'd done my time in, in the dead. You know, I sort of, the security, security industry isn't risk-reward ratio balanced at all. You know, you could be in Yemen, Libya or Somalia on 50% of what you're on taking the UAE Royal Family super yacht from Barcelona to Maldives. So I was like, well, where's the money? And it's in the corporate close protection. So... I didn't have cargo pants and, and tight tops. You know, it was like, <laughs> it was a nice dinner jacket, shirt and, and brogues. Uh, and and that, was, that was my approach. But 
everyone has this perception of special forces you know is about offensive action it's, it's you know breaching walls it's, it's kicking in doors and things like that that's 25 percent of what we do 50 percent of what we do is is support and influence it's hearts and minds being embedded with the locals understanding actually what is the situation on the ground not what i'm seeing on tv but what is actually physically going on in the ground so for me i really built up good relationships with local fixers you know, mm-hmm. there's 167 tribes in libya so my fixer in tripoli isn't my same fixer in benghazi so i, I quickly understood that especially during that that arab spring and i just returned from the london olympics i was providing security for mm-hmm. visa and i was in benghazi the evening that your american ambassador got killed um september 11 2012 and i i got a phone call could i escort help a German oil company, eight German engineers, get them out of Benghazi. So while it was all, I think they made a film 13 hours, while it was all kicking off in the city, I got these guys safely from Benghazi to Tripoli through safe houses that I I had in the desert. And again, I remember we had drivers from Benghazi and we got to the safe house and we could, you know, we could drive to Tripoli in a day, but I said, no, we'll wait here for 48 hours, which was worrying the engineers a bit. And the Benghazi guys had like big, big beards and they're like, oh no, no, Mr. Dean, we can go. I said, no, no, we wait 48 hours. But they were nervous. I knew they were nervous going into Tripoli because they're from the wrong region. Um, But what they weren't aware of is I was getting drivers coming in from Tripoli to meet us and they would carry on. Um, It's it's that sort of knowledge, knowing who to use uh, and when to use. And I remember the morning we were leaving and these poor guys in Benghazi, because I couldn't tell them, they'd shaved all their beards. <laughs> and then I went outside and the, the Tripoli drivers had turned up. It was like a, almost like a scene from the OK Corral. They all started going for their weapons. I said, look, I said, I cannot take you to Tripoli. You will compromise us. Mm-hmm. These guys can do it. And I said, look, you will still get paid. And it's just all about respect. You know, I, I always say about communication, but for that operation, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, divulge too much to them. So I got them safely out, and then two years later, I was in um, Brazil for visa again, covering the World Cup. And I then get a phone call from the Canadian embassy. So what had happened now, it was the Tripoli war. It's a civil war between the militias and the government. And embassies, the, the only reason embassies are in countries is all about trade and investment. You know, what can we get for, for our country you know, when, it, when things start opening up? So October 13, the, um, they'd done an assessment, the Canadians, and basically it was costing them $20 million a year to have the embassy open. And their sort of assessment was there's going to be no trade investment for about at least 15 years. So when we see a window of opportunity, let's collapse the embassy and leave. But they couldn't just collapse them because the locals would be questioning them. So fast forward now, summer 14, the Tripoli War, the Americans, the Brits, the Italians, they just shut shop mm-hmm. and went. Well, the Canadians aren't going back. So they had to shred everything and stay there. Their protection team was Canadian military and they would fly in every four months, rotate, you know, fly into Tripoli International Airport. But during their period of four months, they never left the walls of Tripoli. They just went from their accommodation to the office. They didn't get out of the city. So they didn't know what was beyond the city walls. And it's actually only 100 kilometers, a coastal road from Tripoli to Tunis. So I flew in. And we'd already evacuated a couple of people from US aid. And I, I, did, I don't go with the big overt vehicles, I like local taxis, mm-hmm. just keep it all low profile. And the week before the British got engaged at every checkpoint on the way to, um, to Tunis, which was obviously worrying the, the Canadians. So me and my fixer, um, we went out. And we just, rather than speaking to the guys who got the weapons, you know, identified who the tribal elders was sat down with them, you know, shared bread, shared coffee. And it was actually all about communication, mm-hmm. showing them respect. And um, yeah, the following, following day, they then escorted us safely. So I've got 18 military and four diplomats single-handedly from Tripoli to, to Tunis. So. Yeah, just to put that in perspective a little bit, when I was a, a young SEAL before, before you know, um, September 11th, one of the main missions, I did two deployments with the Marine Corps on ships, and one of the main missions that we would train for is called a, a NEO, non-combatant evacuation operation, which is literally to go into whatever, you know, an American embassy, presumably, 
and go in in some hostile or semi-hostile country and evacuate those people but they would have an entire amphibious ready group with you know several battalions of marines the air support the seals all to go and get whatever that group is out of the country so when i was reading that portion of the book where you made this happen that's a that's a huge deal to do this Essentially, a mission that normally uh, that that could utilize an entire amphibious ready group with yeah. airframes and ships and the whole nine yards to make this happen, and you were able to do it um, in a different from a different angle by utilizing the locals by having building relationships with the locals, going and doing it low profile. That's just a it's a real credit to the way you were thinking about that operation. Yeah, you have to think out of the box, you know. The, the fish wagons, there's fish wagons that take fish from Tripoli to Tunis every day. So we used the fish wagons to put the equipment in because they would just go straight through uh, border control. And they were a bit slower getting to Tunis and I could see the Canadians getting a, getting a bit a bit worried. But yeah, it was just thinking thinking out the box. We did have UAV coverage. There was UAV coverage to, to the border. And then when we were at the border, the, the Canadians then met. But I did that job um, for free. Mm. And the reason I did that was the year before. I just finished a. Uh, we're no, probably going to touch on it. Here. Well, I mean, go ahead. It's 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 an interesting perspective. Um, you 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 got yourself into a situation yeah. that maybe didn't give the best image of what you were trying to do. Yeah. So so my role within the security industry, I was very ad hoc. You know, when I got out, a lot of my friends went over to work in the UAE and train their military, um, which is great, good money and things like that. But I wanted to learn more. You know outside that military environment as well. I, I actually did more sensitive jobs as a private security operator than I did when I was in the special forces. And, you know, I worked all over Africa, Yemen, you know, every time I got a phone call, it was a different country, it was a different job. And um, I'd just come out of Yemen and I was in Dubai and uh, I got a phone call from my, my friend. We just set up a, a new company in London and he said, can you be can you be in Libya tomorrow? I said, well, I can't. My, my visa's expired. So don't worry about that. This you, is a different call. By the way, I did that quote earlier. Did you? Can you be Can you be in Libya, Libya tomorrow? This is another time that that happened. This is so another this, time. This, was what, this is what you were doing. That once you got out of the military, you're running these security events. Yeah. You're providing security. You're doing assessments. You're doing evacuations. And so this is another time when you got the call, hey, can you be in Libya tomorrow? Yeah, can you be in Libya tomorrow? And I was out. Like, oh. Well, no, because my visa's expired. And he said, you don't need a visa. I was like, fine. So uh, we flew via Manchester, flew straight in, and I, I, got to the, um, I got to the airport terminal. And this young guy comes up to me and said, you Mr. Dean? I said, yeah, Mr. Dean. He said, follow me. So everyone's in the queue for passports, mm -hmm. and, and we went in another queue. And um, we went to, took me into the city, we went to the Tebesti Hotel, uh, which is uh, part of the Crimfia Hotel Group. But I knew that was owned by the Maltese and also by the government. And one of the guys, like, he said, right, met my, my, one of my partners there, my business partners. And he said, right, you're just about to go meet the prime minister of Libya. He speaks no English, speaks mm -hmm. German. So the health minister is going to translate. I was like, okay, fine. So a bit, to put a bit bored on the backstory, about 48 hours before, the militias had seized all the oil terminals to stop exporting of oil in Libya. And so we went upstairs and he sits down and he explains his situation to me. And um, he said, well, what do we do? And I said, well, I said, what do you want? He said, I want, I want terminals back, the terminals back. And I said, look, well, we can, we can pull a team together, you know, do four, four simultaneous assaults. You know, you don't want to do back to back because you're, you're warm. Right? Four simultaneous assaults, either from sea or from land, but leave the flank open for them to escape. He said, no, I don't want them to escape. And I sort of looked over to my friend um, and he said, this has been sanctioned. Oh, that really? So is that okay? So, so let me just translate this for people that might not be tracking. So there's oil um, rigs that have been seized. The prime minister of Libya is sitting there telling you, I want these things back from these insurgents or yeah. whatever you want to call them. I want these oil rigs back from these insurgents. I want you to do a simultaneous, or you said, hey, I can do a simultaneous assault. Yeah. So you're going to need a lot of people to do this. Yeah. And then you say, listen, you know, smart thing. You're thinking, hey, I'll give them a way to get out so that way they're not going to stand and fight, hopefully, and, you know, we'll, we'll mitigate damage. And he says, no, we don't want anyone to escape. We want you to go and kill all these people that are yep. on these oil rigs. 
And that's so that's the, the the mission tasking that you're getting. Okay, so that's, that's the mission tasking, and and for the listeners, so basically in Libya, Benghazi over in the east is where all the oil is, and the the pol- politicians are all in the west. And again, different tribes they do not get on well. So and then in the middle you've got Misrata as well, and they're just in, so there's a, it's a big mess. So I, I walked out of this meeting and I'm like, ah, right, I'm gonna need at least 150 guys, you know, 50 tier one and 70 tier two. And this was being funded. He said, yeah, make it happen. So you know, straight away, so I'm like, I'm, I'm having to make phone calls. And I would it, love to see the invoice uh, on this that you're gonna send. Yeah. But the, and, and it was, you no, know, the money we were getting for this job was four times your normal daily wage, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I, I, was, I had guys on standby in UK on like, twice as much they're doing in, in Iraq and, and Afghan, just staying at home. It, it, it was huge, it started to grow in, in, into a beast. And every evening I would go up and speak to the Prime Minister, update where we are in this situation. And um, you know, this went on for like two or three weeks. The problem I had was some guys were starting to come in and it was trying to hide them, you know, to keep them out of view. Because there was other private security companies there who I knew, I had a great reputation in, in Libya. And they're like, oh, what, what, what are you doing, Dean? I'm like, oh, I'm reviewing my evacuation plans. And it was like, you know, the guys do look very special forces. So this went on for about three weeks and um, putting all the planning into place, doing all our recce, using his private jet, you know, to fly over the areas, identifying, you know, if there's any aircraft we can utilize. You know, we're at the top of the, the, the equipment list. We had kit coming in from like Plat Attack, you know, all over the world. Um, so yeah, it was a big invoice. And, um, this evening I went up to the Prime Minister and he said, look, he said, I need to go to um, to New York tomorrow. It's the UN conference. But each evening he said, please come up, brief up the Health Minister. I said, it's fine. So the following evening I went upstairs and the Health Minister's there. And, and so now the Prime Minister went to New York. He's in New York now. And now yeah. you're just alone with the... The Health Minister. The Health Minister. Who actually turns out to be not the Health Minister, but a hospital manager from um, London. It's the only guy he could trust. So it's very closed doors. But in the in the corner of my left was a, a larger gentleman with a big bushy tash and he's just saying nothing. So me and the Health Minister are chatting away. Next thing, he just starts screaming, Libyan. They start arguing in, in Libyan. So I just pull my pull my chair back and let it, let it quiet down. I mean, he just then started talking in, in the perfect English. He said, who are you? And I told him who I was. And he said, what are you doing here? And I explained. And he was the head of their SIS, their intelligence service. And he said, no one knows this is happening in government. You know, he's going, the prime minister's gone on his own back. I was like, okay. And he said, where are we with it? I said, well, this is the stage we're at, you know, one or two more weeks and we're ready to go. And he said, like, I'm not saying stop it, but can we slow it down? And I'm thinking, yeah, the daily wage we're on, we can slow it down as much as you want. <laughs> and I said, yeah, of course. <laughs> so we, uh, I said, well, look, I'll tell you what we'll do is why not we design a special forces training program for the Libyans in the West and the, and the Libyans in the East because they would we'll never train together. That way it would be, cover the reason why there's equipment coming in it would justify where there's guys coming in so we, so we went to an agreement on that keep us all on payroll yeah, 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 yeah. Well. So drag this right <laughs> out so um so that's that's what we did anyway the you know the government paying it was a third party i can't mention it was paying for this and about a week later they said look you know we are siphoning money here yeah. um let's call it a day because we can pick this up anytime we can come back and pick up i said yeah perfect let's do that so i sent i started sending the guys back and one of my best friends he stayed out with me i said look we'll go back tomorrow that evening we're in the um there's a restaurant at the top of the hotel a nice moroccan open air restaurant and we could hear a distinct sound of an ac-130 <laughs> you know what a hercules aircraft sound it is like distinct and we're like that's a herc but there was four AC-130s at Melita Military Airport around the corner. But they were grounded. They didn't work because we'd already done the recce on them. See if we could utilize them. Thought nothing of it. Anyway, the next morning, all over the world news, Delta Force had come in and picked up an AQ guy responsible for the Kenz- Kenya and Tanzania bombings. So obviously the Prime Minister, when he'd gone to the UN, had done an agreement with the Americans and given it the green light, which is fine. But of course, everyone thought that was me. <laughs> you know, me and my mate trying to get out of the airport that day was, was difficult. <laughs> Bec- and, uh, and obviously explaining to the other security companies, I said, that, that wasn't me. We got out. Um, the prime minister got back about three days later. He got arrested 
by the militias. He, he got released in the end. Again, people thought I was responsible for that. I wasn't. So I kept a low profile for about a couple mm -hmm. of weeks and I flew back, back in. And I was winning contracts. I was getting some good contracts, but I wasn't getting your, your oil and gas, your NGOs. I wasn't getting the big ones. And I met a friend who's an ex-SAS guy uh, who's a security advisor for PMC. Um, oh, sorry, PwC. And he says, um, he says, Stotty, everyone thinks you're you're a mercenary. You, you're, I said, we're not mercenary. I said, it was sanctioned by the various governments. It was actually a show of force how quickly we could pull a private team together. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah, we know that. He said, but for the general, you know, corporations who do their diligence, they, they don't see it like that. So then when it came to the, the Canadian embassy one, everyone had gone. No security companies were going to come back in and help the Canadians. So when I came in, they said, well, what's the cost? And I said, I think it was about $7,000 and that was to cover the fish wagons, mm -hmm. <laughs> my fixer. And, and I, I, I charged nothing. And they're like, what? You know, everyone was like, you could have made. But for me, it was actually then brushed off mm -hmm. that reputation of being a mercenary and then put my name on the top of the pile as being the number you one. You did that up for $7,000? $7,000. We got 24, uh, sorry, 22 people, a uh, whole embassy. <laughs> safely <laughs> to tune in. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My wife's like, ah, you should have charged. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you could have kept your re re reputation yeah. or re earned back your reputation and at least made a little <laughs> money on the side. But for me, it's all about, you know, it wasn't the money. I liked, like to help people. Yeah. And, and that's what I wanted to get across and is the fact. And yeah, it did. Yeah, no, you, it's you a, then it's, became number it, one in the industry. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a strategic move, obviously, yeah. to, to do that and take care of those people and and give them a good deal and, and clean your reputation up after it had been a little bit, you know, tarnished by this involvement. And, and you know, you, you go into some details in the book on that about just, just the fact that, you know, you can be sitting there talking to the actual prime minister of the country at mm -hmm. the time and it's not what it looks like. No. <laughs> No, no, exactly. Um, I want to back up a little bit. This uh, one part in the book, you're talking about your new normal, and this is what you're doing. Um, your dad had been diagnosed with cancer. You drove to the hospital. When you got to the hospital, your sisters are there. Your stepmom's there. They'd been there, kind of, kind of just toiling with the whole situation. You show up and put them on rotation, like, hey. <laughs> I'm going home. I'll be back in the morning. Um, you know, you need to get some sleep because they were at they were at the edge. And then you come back, um, and you go into this. The next eight hours was probably the longest continuous amount of time that we had ever spent together. This is with your dad in the hospital. He's in rough shape. We had a bit of a chat, but it was superficial. He was on painkillers, but that had never been our style, anyways. I knew I loved him. He knew I loved him, and I knew he loved me. Anything else I can do for you? I asked him. He told me he had a pain in his leg. I saw he had a problem with one of his pain relief devices. I took a couple of seconds to fix it, and instantly he looked serene and nodded off to sleep. When the girls returned that evening, he was still peaceful. I've never seen him look so calm, my stepmom said. Well, that's because he hasn't got three women fussing over him, isn't it? I joked. Every squad he knows that dark humor is how you cope with death. I stood up and gave my dad a pat on the shoulder. When will you be back? When will you be back? One of my sisters asked me. I shook my head. I won't. I'm going back to Aberdeen. They couldn't believe it. I've said my goodbyes, I told them, and my family are up in Aberdeen. That's where I need to be. I knew it would be the last time that I saw him, and I was at peace with that. Back in Aberdeen that night, I got news that I had been expecting. How's your dad doing? Alana asked me the next day at breakfast. He died last night, I replied, and went back to eating my cereal. I was that blasé about the whole thing. I didn't realize it then, but death had been normalized for me. So too had my ways of coping with it, a complete numbing of my emotions. My father had passed away, and I'd given my wife the news in the same way that I'd tell her that the kettle had just boiled. Over the next week or so, I took control of the practical side of my dad's death. I helped arrange the funeral and made contact with the Royal Engineers Association so that they could be present. I wore my lavats, one of the ceremonial uniforms of the Royal Marines and the SBS. I wore my green beret, my medals, and my father's. It was the last time that I wore the uniform, and I suppose that it was a, tr a fitting tribute in itself. My dad had been a huge part of me beginning in the, my military journey, and now he was part of its end. How are you feeling, Alana asked me after the funeral. 
I need to leave the house at 0600 hours tomorrow to get to the airport, I told her in reply. In a moment when most people are racked by emotion, I was pr- planning my travel for the job in South Africa. I was relentless, but in pursuit of what and why. Now, obviously, you know, it's uh, something that, you know, we, we, we have to deal with death on a, mm. on a big way, and in, especially when with, with people that, you know, I, I don't know how, how old your dad was when he died, but yeah, you know, 67, I think, yeah. Had a, had a grown son and, and, and kids and had lived his life. And, you know, I, I know for me, you know, for us, it's hard because we see, we, we see our friends that die that are, 27 32 you know they they haven't had that opportunity and i think that's something that makes a little sense in my head of when someone older dies of course it's sad but you know that they had a good life and they had that opportunity and then like you said you know um we we unfortunately have to see a lot of people die and you have to figure out how to get through that and sometimes maybe it's not the well, sometimes I guess we take the emotional side of it and and have to stifle it down. Maybe not the best thing to do, but it's kind of what we do. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's how we deal with things. Like, like with my with my father, you know, when I joined the, arm, the army, that was it. That was my new family. My, one of my sisters stayed with my with my dad, and my other sister went up to her mum. So they they had their own lives. So when I joined the army, that was it. That was my family. You know, I would only get in touch. My dad was old school. You know, what I mean he. <laughs> I remember getting a phone call. It's like, you've got to ring your dad. I'm like, really? You know, and it was because when a cousin had come over from Australia, he would only ring if it was really, really important. So I would do my normal birthdays and Christmas, and that was enough. No news was good news mm-hmm. in my family. My, my dad sort of knew the score. He, he would know about me coming back from a tour. I wouldn't tell him when I was going. So we, we had that, that relationship. So, you know, we weren't close, close. Um, but I think it was just after Christmas. We knew he'd been diagnosed and, and it was terminal and things like that. And my sister said, you need to come down, you need to come down. And I know that she was being a bit overreactive. And then her husband rang me and said, you now need to come down. So I was like, yeah, I'll come down. And I went in there and literally they're all watching is every breath. You know, their eyes were like piss holes in the snow. They've had no sleep for like 24 hours. So I'd just flown in. I hadn't seen them for months. I said, right, I'm just off to my friend's house. And that what? I said, because, you know, you you guys tomorrow will, will be useless, you know. I mean, I just, the military just kicked mm-hmm. in, right? We need to do centuries. We need to do routines. And uh, I remember my mum calling me from Manchester, Dean, you, you need to calm down. It's like, you know, they're, they're upset. You, you deal with death differently than, mm-hmm. than they do. But like I said, the eight hours I had with my dad, you know, that was the longest I had. And, you know, for me, I'd, I'd said my goodbyes and... Yeah, I, I, I just I just went, in. but that was 2014. It was the same year that I evacuated the Canadian embassy. When I came back from that trip, I did the same thing again. I sat down, and my normal SOP would be to you know deservice and reservice my kit, ready for the next phone call. And one of my shirts was was covered in blood. Uh, I'd administered first aid at a traffic accident at the border. So I said to my wife, I said, "Can we get the the blood out?" And she goes, "Yeah." I want to know why there's blood in there. And I sort of said, well, I've just evacuated Canadian embassy. And she's like, oh. she's like, it's, like it's another throwaway comment. Like you told me your dad's just died. So actually we sat down that evening, down two bottles of port. And yeah, tears started flowing. And really what it was is actually I hadn't come to terms with the fact that I'd left the special forces. I was still trying to match that adrenaline rush that I had when I was still in. So everything, even approaching the fact that my father had died yeah, that hadn't hadn't sunk in mm-hmm. so as you mentioned earlier it takes a whole brigade to evacuate someone you know i didn't have that top cover i didn't have the helo support the, the guys coming in so that's when the the pin dropped for me mm-hmm. that something needs to change and it was actually all about communication and i i'd, I'd, I'd built it up inside me and it was that evening that it really kicked in that you, your dad's not here and you, you, you don't have to prove a point um anymore so um yeah it was a big you know, i think it's called the chapter's called dead or divorced as well mm-hmm. <laughs> so you know i'd reached that t-junction i was either gonna die or not have a family right. if i didn't change the way my, my lifestyle you um one of the things that you you breezed over is when you when you did the world cup in brazil and um 
uh, well, I'll just jump into it. it. It was at the Brazil versus Cameroon game that I got a ch- chance to catch up with a friend of mine. He was there representing the football association because his brother couldn't make it. Happy that my clients were secure with the other lads. I left my place and went to the presidential box to meet my mate from the army. All right, Stotty, he said. How are you, mate? I asked him. We'd met back in 2007 at a joint tactical air controller Sorry, Joint Terminal Attack Controller JTAC course held at RAF Leeming. There were 18 students, and when we'd been told to behave towards a certain individual, as we would to anybody else in the forces, no special treatment. It was on the second day that we hit it off, when we were being given our call signs. From the back of the room, I'd made a joke at his expense, and there was a sharp inhalation of breath as everybody waited to see how it would look, or see how he, would, see how he took it. He laughed, and that was how I came to be paired up for the rest of the course with Prince Harry, who is one of the most decent blokes you could meet. He's a military man through and through, and I think part of the reason he loved the Army so much was that he could just be himself. He was comfortable in this environment, and he could handle his rank and job as well as any other soldier I'd met. It was great to see him in Brazil, not because he was a prince, but because he was a comrade from my days in kit, just like one of the boys. How long was that course? So that's a six-week course. So this, we're going back now to 2007. Mm. And, um, you know, RAF Lehman, you know, it's, it's got all, all your fighter pilots, you know, your, your tornadoes and your Euro fighters, you know, with their, with their brown shoes probably. And the um, and, and literally the, the RAF Lehman, the, the JTAC course is a wooden hut at the end of the runway. You know, no one <laughs> even knows we're there. So I remember walking in the room and, and, and clocking him. He's probably about 23. So basically, this is when he he wanted to go on his first tour to Afghanistan. But he couldn't just go on tour. Mm-hmm. You know, he had to have a, a role within the unit. And his commanding officer was an SAS guy and said, well, look, go on your JTAC course. You could be the regimental forward air controller. So that's what he did. He, he came on the course. And like I said, because he was there, you know, every man and his dog turned up for some FaceTime with him. And, you know, it was was cringing. But the back four, the the, the lads at the back, four in the back, were two SES and two SBS guys. And he was literally sat in front of me. And, you know, everyone did their their opening address. Harry then left the room. And then the commandant was like, right, gets no preferential treatment. You know, treat him like one in his own, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, fine. Harry then comes back in, and the first lecture is call signs. So on the course, you call jackpot one to jackpot one eight, so that at least the pilot knows <laughs> who the student is. And then, you know, for example, the prefix for special boat service is mayhem. So I'm mayhem four three, and you know, widowmaker for the SAS. So Harry puts his hand up. He says, um, you know, if successful on this course. Do I get a call sign? And I just blurted out, yeah, you're Fox Piss One, <laughs> like that. And of course, everyone was just like, uh, you know, you can't say that. And I'm just like, well, you've just told me to treat him like the one. So he turns over, you know, looks at the berry, smiles at me. I thought, oh, God, you know, I'm going to get beheaded by the queen. <laughs> and um, that afternoon, the Sergeant Major comes back in and he's like, right, I've randomly picked these jackpot numbers. You'll be working with me. And he, he, he pulled the, an SAS guy an SBS guy, Prince Harry, and an RAF officer. And then the other 14, which didn't make sense, were with it. I was like, well, you've randomly picked those. <laughs> but you could see on the course, that was when I got my sort of first exposure. So me and him got partnered off because they knew he wasn't going to get any preferential treatment. And I, and I think... <laughs> you made that quite clear. I made that quite clear. <laughs> but also the fact that he he's probably his most comfortable there because he wasn't being critiqued by the media and, and everyone mm. else. He could be Harry, he could be, you know, Lieutenant Wales and things like that. And he was actually a, a good operator. You know, he's clear and precise over the net. He didn't get flustered. Um, so, no, he, he's well worthy of, of that role. And and we maintain that relationship. After that, we you know, we, we did a lot together. We do a lot in, in charity. And I, I remember going to we had a, it's a big rugby game called the army navy each year at twickenham it's like it's the biggest mm-hmm. rugby event 150,000 people turn up Damn. yeah yeah they drink more alcohol on that one weekend <laughs> than every international rugby game so he was, was my wife um alana she didn't really know i knew him and i'd not long been injured so my legs in a brace and we're at twickenham and uh i i he texts me so let's catch up in a car park so we're caught up in a car park and this was this was now as he was training to be a pilot. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we, we started chatting and he said, look, I've passed my course. I need to make a decision, you know, whether I fly Apache or Lynx. And Lynx is like, it's like a glorified taxi driver for getting generals around. 
And when we're chatting to the uh, the Apache call signs in Afghan, their, their prefix is ugly. No, mm. ugly one, ugly two. So I said, look, I always tell the lads to go ugly early. <laughs> um, so he, he, th- he then messaged me uh, a few days later and said, yeah, I'm going ugly. So he then goes Apache. Fast forward and um, we're at a big special forces charity event and he's he's a guest on my table. And they auctioned off a special boat service, like um, statue, silver plated. It went for like forty thousand pounds. And Harry's ah, that's beautiful. And I was like, not for forty grand. Like, I knew, I knew the bronze one was only seventy five pounds. You know, and I was like, <laughs> so I, I did. I, I I bought one and I I got it. Um, I got I got it laminated. And I and I said, you know, Harry, I said, congratulations on being ugly. You know, mayhem for free. And got it delivered to the palace. But um, but yeah, he. You know, he did 10 years and he then did another tour. You know, that was where he was, he was most comfortable. And that's when we started, you know, building our relationship. You know, the re, you know, he's, 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 he's got me so tight who people he can trust. Mm. Uh, and, and, and to be part of that 13 years later is a big thing. I think he knows obviously the integrity of the special forces. You know, you know, people, I, I get messages all the time. Can you speak to Harry? And like, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> Delete. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's. I just. I wonder because he he's gonna end up playing a role a little later. He is, yeah. Um, but going back to the dead or divorced section mm-hmm. of this book, um, so you pretty much you get the message like yeah. I'm either gonna get divorced or I'm gonna be dead. I don't like either one of those outcomes. So you 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 kind of stand down from the security stuff, and you got to get a job. Yeah. Like a regular job. So we'll go to the book here. I needed a job and Alana suggested that I come work with her in in the property development sector. It would be a chance for me to learn about something outside kicking in doors and sneaking people out of countries. And because I wanted what was best for my family, I gave it a go. I was about an hour into it before I started to fantasize about launching myself out of the nearest window. <laughs> Everything that I'd done in my life, I had done with the ethos of unrelenting pursuit pursuit of excellence the unrelenting pursuit of excellence. And I tried to bring that attitude into the office, but something was missing. And you, uh, you spend some time doing that, and, and <laughs> then she can tell that you're miserable. Yeah. And you're trying to suck it up like a, good, uh, like a good man. And finally she says, you know, you look miserable, and you're like, yeah, I am. And she says, why don't you, why don't you start biking to the office, start cycling to the office. And it's 10 miles each way, you start doing that. You're starting to, that's cool. Hey, you're starting to get, you're starting to get after it, you know, on the bike and trying to beat your times and all that. And she says, you know, basically you're still not happy, are you? And you admit to her like, no, I don't like sitting in a cubicle or whatever it is you're doing. And finally one day she, she rolls in on you and you know, she's holding something. What's that? I asked her. She had a book in her hands, a big one. Alana threw it at me. Read it and pick something. She said. I looked down at what had landed in my lap. She knew me. I smiled, opened the cover, and began reading Guinness Book of World's Record yeah. <laughs> records. So, so that's what she did. She threw this book at you and said, "Figure out what. Figure out something to do." Yeah, yeah. So, so a bit about Alana. Actually, you know, when when I transition, you hear horror stories when people are transitioned from the military. Some can be quite turbulent and some quite smooth. So, when I met Alana, actually, she was a bank manager for all the three of the biggest banks in Aberdeen. So when I'm worried about, you know, certain paperwork, she set up my first security company on her phone watching TV. You know, like for me, it's like whether I've ticked the right box. So she she knew about the corporate side, which helped my transition yeah. and, and is a massive part in, in, in moving forward. So when I came back from the Canadian embassy, the dead or divorce thing, it was actually she thought I wanted to go away and I thought that she needed me to go away to make money. So it was actually a lack of communication. Mm. You know, we sat down, we sort of communicated and she said, well, look, we don't need money. I've got my own property business. You know, come come work with me. So I said, fine. So this is about five years now from leaving the military to this stage of my life. My le- my injured leg was now two kilos lighter than my good leg because of the muscle wasted. So when I was away on these security jobs, if there was a gym there, I, I, I took my TRX everywhere. You know, it was a very upper body focus and just neglected my CV. So I just bought a push bike. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I got to look at Echo about that. <laughs> he's skipping leg days, bro. He's going out. He's just worried about those guns. I don't know anything about that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, I, um, so, so I bought a push bike off Amazon, you know, and bought some Batman Lycra thinking it was cool. It wasn't. Um, <laughs> but I didn't know anything about cycling. And I, I, but straight away, just it's only about eight miles, eight miles, but being physically active, and you, you felt that was a, a 
big weight off your shoulders. You know, I can't For run sure. anymore. And I just thought, perfect. But, you know, with my backstory, sat in these architects and planners meetings, I was like, oh, no interest in these drawings and you know what i mean <laughs> and my, my wife could she, she could see the glaze over my eyes you know i was more interested in the coffee and the biscuits actually when my son was born i was the one holding the baby feed, feeding the baby while she was doing all the work you, know, you just felt like you know is this it is this all i've got to offer now i, I didn't want to be taking those risks I, I did before so i was about a month before my 40th birthday and I was getting ground middle age crisis ground rush and I was like I always remember doing I always remember reading Guinness Book of Records so you know I was thinking cycling because it's not impacting my knee you know maybe I should have had 12 Ferrero Rochers in a minute or something something a bit easier but living in Scotland I was thinking maybe, you know, maybe Aberdeen to Dundee is about 60 miles my wife had found the world's longest road it's like from southern Argentina to northern Alaska so she, I was like, I said a joke that she clearly wanted me out of the house and I was like fuck so it's like it's, it's, yeah it's 14,000 miles so it's called the Pan American Highway called the right? Pan American Highway yeah so you know to give you an idea because of the curvature, curvature of the earth it's just the equivalent to cycling from London to Sydney and then another 4,000 miles it's, it's that big you know it's 22 <laughs> so I thought Perfect, you know. So having only cycled less than twenty miles, I applied for the world record, which you know some people think is quite arrogant. <laughs> but I thought in my head, I said, "Well, no, I, I have that endurance mindset. If the knee's not going to be an issue, then then why not? Why why can't I do this?" So I, I applied for the world record. The world record was one hundred twenty five days at this point, and then six weeks later, Guinness came back and said, "Yes, you've been successful on your application." During this period, someone else has already beaten the world record. It's now 117 days. I was like, great. So already I've got to take eight days off my original plan. Um, so we, we mentioned Harry already, which is perfect, rolls into this. So Harry and I, you know, we do a lot in charity stuff. You know, he used to come on, on my table. I had a an intelligence fusion cell based in Mozambique in Tanzania. So, you know, these guys would give me in reports of where the ivory was going from Africa, you know, mm. to the Far East, you know, so I would be obviously t t pushing this information up the line to Harry, who would then be getting out. So we're doing a lot in charity anyway. So I, I when Guinness came back, you know, I, I rang him up and I said, look, I'm going to cycle the world's longest road and, uh, you know, do it in a world record. What, sh what should we do it in? And the... This was 2016. So his brother and Kate and him were about to launch a campaign in 2017 called Heads Together, which was a mental health campaign. Um, in the military, I'd seen it firsthand, you know, some of my friends, you know, and but I wasn't aware how big an issue I was for the whole of society. You know, it's, it's very much everyone talks about it nowadays, be it from postnatal depression, young children, teenagers, all the way through. So he said, look, could I do it? for that campaign I said yeah well, Harry asked would you do it and you're not going to say no I said yeah of, of course so um, so I did that and then he then introduced me to the Royal Foundation who sort of deal with all their charity work and um, the first you know you walk in the room and they're like they're probably like oh here you go one of Harry's mates again <laughs> and I sat down and, and uh, they said right first question is how much are you looking to raise and I thought I want, I want to keep them at the table and I said a million pounds I just showered it out and uh, but for me I, I wanted the, the enormity of the challenge to reflect how much you know you, you can't go do like the LA marathon and say you're going to raise a million pounds you know, it, has, it has to be in comparison they said fine I said and what's and what is your messaging? I was like, oh, shit. I didn't thought about it. You know, Harry's just told me to come in here. I was like, um, so I just thought about it. And I said, well, or physical activity helps your mental state. So I said, oh, no, no, you can't use that. I said, well, why not? I said, well, it's not being scientifically proven. So I said, that's fine. I said, but I don't need a scientist to tell me that I feel good when I'm being physically active. So I ignored them anyway and carried on promoting that. And then obviously now is very much recognized Factual. as one of, yeah, yeah, it's one of the coping mechanisms. So, so that was the birth of the of the Pan American Highway Challenge. Um, sort of fell into it by accident. And the, the, a lot of people doubted you because you had <laughs> very, no experience on a bike. You know, these other people that are setting these records, you know, they they that's what their life is. They're experienced yeah. racers and whatever else. And you just decide, yeah, watch this. Hold yeah. my beer. <laughs> yeah. well, we, we, the sponsorship marketing team, we did a SWOT analysis at, right at the beginning. It's the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities and threats. And the only weakness that came about was my arrogance towards the cycling community, which I took as a strength. <laughs> and actually, yeah, cycling had evolved so much from when I was a young boy on a BMX. And um, But for me, it wasn't so much about 
the, the physical bit. I thought I'll, I'll deal with that on the time. It was, it was the planning. You know, mm. one of the things we're good at in the military is that meticulous planning and the detail. You know, even in the Canadian Embassy, I, I thought if you have the right plan, then you just bring that in. You know, so I just took a military set of orders and put it on here and I just crossed out ammunition. And that's when I started, uh, started putting the plan together. But I was taking experiences that I had in the military from before I and mean, then sort of putting it into this challenge. I love the phrase that you can't be experienced without experiences. So mm. I've had experiences before and then what, how can I sort of transfer that onto this? So one thing we used to do in the special forces, which I thought was, was great, uh, not because like we're one of the best in the world, it's because we're always evolving, we're always learning and always changing. And when we used to come off the ground, we used to do a thing called, a, before we even go clean your weapons and admin yourself, it was called a hot debrief. You know, while it's still fresh in your mind. And the three questions that were posed were, what worked? What didn't work? And if we were going to do that again, what would we do differently? So at the time, I was reading magazines, I was buying books about cycling, you know, but I wasn't getting those answers that I needed. And I thought, well, the best people to speak to are those that have done it before you. You know, they've been there. They've been on that road. They'll, they'll be able to give me the answers. So I did. I reached out to the previous record holders and I, I just posed those three questions. And I, I was getting all the information in. And all their issues, they would all start in Alaska and finish in Argentina, but all their issues were in South and Central America. So for me, I was like, well, why take a gamble with the second half? Mm. You know, why not get, you know, bit bureaucracy at the borders, languages, spares for your bikes? Why not address those issues early? And then when you get into America, we can then reassess where we are. So one of the things I was proud of is that I'd ignored everyone else and I turned it on its head. My start point was from uh, from southern Argentina. So that's that's how I came up with that plan. But, the, you know, there's a lot more to it than just grabbing a water bottle and a helmet <laughs> and cycling north. You know what I mean? When you're putting the planning together, you know, I had a support team and a documentary team who were very much more risk averse than myself. You had to be considering their welfare. So there's, there's things you, you don't really think about, elections. You know, what's the best time? You're going to go through a country in the middle of elections. There needs civil unrest, you know. What's, what's going to give you the most advantage season-wise? You know, there's there's so much, which is what we do in the military, you know, that, and, and that's, yeah. that's what it was. And um, so that's where the planning came from. It's from what I, I picked up before. And then training-wise, yeah, I, I then, you know, uh, Harry and I did a... Um, did a little promo video together to promote the challenge. And once the camera's finished, he said... Now, what training are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to do Land's End John O'Groats. So Land's End John O'Groats is the southern point of England to northern Scotland um, because the Pan American Highway was 15 of them back to back. So I said, if I can't do one, how was I going to do 15? So I said, I'm going to do that. And he said, well, I do it with some of the members of the Invictus Games. I said, yeah, of course I can. But I didn't want to do it with them and embarrass myself. So I, having only cycled three weeks, I <laughs> rang my mate and I said, I'm going to go do lands in John O'Groats and everyone's like whoa you're not ready yet you don't know you haven't even been cycling you're not bike fit and and, and I, I thought bike fit was fitness it's actually your measurements to your bike oh. uh, yeah <laughs> so I, I you just I, fooled me too yeah I was yeah, like, yeah, hmm. yeah so I, I set off from Cornwall we had the first two days was a huge storm storm Angus the third day I fell off my bike fractured my scaphoid I got up to Scotland it was uh, the coldest it had been in, in 10 years it was minus 16 <laughs> I, I wrote off the first bike and my friend just went and bought one off the shelf. I, I did everything completely wrong in, in, in the cycling world. But for me, if I couldn't do one, how was I going to do 15? Mm -hmm. and, and then we then did it six months later with these guys. And I was bike fit. I knew about cadence and, and things like that. And I, I understand more of the listeners in UK is that Land's End John O'Groats is, is on a bucket list for cyclists. But for me, it was a training ride. And I almost had to approach it in that manner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, what I like about all this, I mean, it's, it's something I, I, I've been saying to veterans for a long time, which is, you know, when you get out, you got to find a new mission. If you don't have a new mission, that's when things start going sideways. And, you know, for you, your first new mission was doing the security stuff. And you did that, you attacked that. And then all of a sudden, you had to pull back from that to take care of your family. You, you tried the new mission of the cubicle and the, the drawings, as, you, as you'd call them. That, that wasn't a mission for you. Then you got this in your head, and now you had a new mission, something to focus on, something to do, a positive thing. And, uh, you know, obviously it takes, moves you in the right direction. It's just, it's a, it's a really great example of something that I say all the time that you actually executed. Yeah. Uh, th this is an interesting section in here. Um, it's called Who Dares Win? 
who dares wins. And you got a you got a unexpected call, and the call the guy says, "My name's Andrew Slater. I'm a television producer." And they had he had this idea they're going to take special forces soldiers and going to put civilians through some kind of a s- form of some kind of selection. And as he's doing this, uh, you know, you're he's interested in having you be one of the guys. Yeah. And the question was, has this been cleared through the MOD, through the Ministry of Defense? And you start running this up the chain of command, and you're you know asking if this can happen or not. And then you get this, uh, I'm going to the book here, a couple weeks later, I received the letter. It wasn't exactly a pleasant memo from the MOD. It cut straight to the point, telling me to step away from the project immediately. I read over the letter a couple of times to make sure I had everything straight, but it was literally in black and white step away from the project or become persona non grata yeah which is png to means you're not you're not welcome anymore yeah. um when it comes to decision making i always listen to my gut instinct and it was telling me loud and clear that i should comply with the mod's wishes i was the sbs ambassador to scotland and i enjoyed that role i enjoyed the sbs association charity events i enjoyed being able to visit pool and hereford I had good mates still in both. Did I want to cut that away in in the vain hope of becoming the next Jason Statham? The answer was clear. I can't do the show, I'm afraid, mate, I told Andrew. No worries, he said. We thought this could be a problem. Have you approached the MOD about the show? I asked him. You're going to have the same problem with everyone unless the show gets cleared. And you, you go on, you, you end up saying the show went ahead and as soon as it became public knowledge, there was a shit storm at the MOD and in Hereford and Poole. The production company and the guys had pushed on without the MOD signing off and the SAS and SBS immediately clear, declared them persona non grata. They were not allowed to attend any association events or to be on camp. To give you any idea of how seriously this was taken, I'd heard of a former general who was persona non grata being escorted off camp in Hereford from his own from his own friend's wake. I didn't want to see that happen to the guys, but it was their decision and not for me to question. Personally, I felt that this sense of community was important for my own happiness and that wasn't worth giving up, worth giving up. I like the lads, they're very close friends, and so I felt for one of them later that year when I saw him at a black tie event held by the regiment He'd come as the guest of someone who was still serving, but when the RSM saw him, he was asked to leave. He, was, he looked absolutely gutted, and who am I to blame him? It was in many ways like being cast out of a family. So it's interesting too, because the reason that was interesting to me as well, because then you, you wrote this book, yeah. but obviously you clear this book through the Ministry of Defense. Um, I've written of t- I've written 49 books or whatever the number is at this point, and you know, again, it's always very, you know, I, I remember the conversations around when, when I hadn't written a book and just saying, like, we're not going to do anything that yeah. sheds any light, that puts anything. We don't have anything bad to say about the military, about the SEAL teams. Like, that's that's not what we're doing. We're obviously not giving away any information that could be useful at all to the enemy. Um, and, you know, that's obviously of, uh, uh, you know, when when we ran these books, when I ran these books, through the chain of command, you know, we, it was like direct comms with people that I knew and yeah. that were in the military and senior ranking positions. And they read them and said, yeah, these are good to go. And, you know, I, I had a great um, uh, senior officer who said, you know, we're quiet professionals, quiet professionals, but that doesn't mean we're silent professionals. Yeah. There's stories that need to be told. There's lessons that need to be passed on. So, you know, you, look, you, you never feel good about it because we're, we're, we're not, we're, we're, we don't want the spotlight. You're never going to feel good about it. And there's always going to be guys that are going to look at you and say, oh, you know, there you are in the spotlight. And that they're, they're totally, I understand them because yeah. I was that guy too. Mm. And so I get it. And there's, that's just the reality of the situation. Um, but it was interesting to see how you had to go through that and, and make those decisions yourself. Yeah, I think I think to me at the at the time when when Andrew came up, you know, said your name keeps coming up. I was like, fine. Um, and I, there was an old documentary years ago called SASU Tough Enough, and it was a massive failure. And I was like, oh god, that's all I had in my head was visions of that. So 
it went on and ended up being one of the most most successful film um, episode on on Channel Four. And and the two guys that I got on it, you know, one of them, he just come out, you know, he got kicked out of the military and then he, he went to prison. You know, for him, you know, there was no other other option mm-hmm. for him. So mm-hmm. him, it was a lifeline. And then the other guy, um, Foxy, I'd say it was Foxy. He he had post traumatic stress. So, but he had post-traumatic stress because his time served in the special forces. He couldn't work in the private security sector. For, so for them guys, it fitted perfect for them. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they had a, a means of income. For me at the time, it didn't work because I was smuggling people across borders. <laughs> um, you know, I was a rela- you know, close relationship with Harry. You know, so at the time, it then didn't look right that you, you were on TV. Say it wasn't, you, you can't do it. It's not because, as you touched on there, people can learn from the military mm-hmm. um, and, and these sort of things are great for that. What upset the military with this was that they filmed it and then flanked them. You know, so I've me being able to get my book out and things like that, you know, I've, I'm still part of the group and I do charity work, but I've been transparent in everything mm-hmm. I do and, and they understand. I think it was just the way that they'd, they'd gone about it in the fact that they, they caught them out by by surprise. Mm-hmm. But for the, for the two guys that I got on the show, you know, they've now got successful careers in that. And they would probably, if they didn't have this show, they'd probably really be struggling, mm-hmm. you know, coming out of prison, having post-traumatic stress. But obviously the military also need to understand that it's a different world, you know, social media, mm-hmm. you know, for me, when I was in, it was, it was a taboo. We were talking about it before, you know, yeah. it is a way 100%. of communicating. And obviously, as long as you don't give away certain things, then you can, there's nothing that you can't get from, from the internet. And, and, and that's it and a lot of it is actually jealousy you know a lot of it is actually jealousy from those that are still in because like, mm. they're not in that position that they can they can do that but for me at the time I, I just it just didn't didn't fit right I'm gonna fast forward a little bit you you know you you're just training and you're fundraising and you're getting ready and you're doing all these taking all these skills that you learn from the military for planning and endurance and mindset and you and you get to a point where you're you're going to launch this thing and um, <laughs> you know you're you're supported on the ground this is just so you, you you mentioned it but you're supported on the ground by a sports massage therapist a bike mechanic a medic a two man camera crew that would be gathering footage to make a documentary about the event it was a big team but with the exception of the documentary crew everyone was doing it pro bono so it wasn't a huge strain on our sponsors um and then finally we get to shortly after dawn on 1 February 2018, I went with my team to the starting point of the Pan American Highway. I had 22,000 kilometers ahead of me and 110 days to do it. No crowds, no big send off. Start freaking pedaling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you, 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 know, you, you, you cover a lot of this um, in the book you know, talking about what, what that's actually like, what is what you're going through, the wind, the, the crashes, the traffic, the heat, the cold, the illness, the, just the mayhem. You know, you, you talked about, you go through four seasons yeah. while you do this. You go through all four seasons. And um, so then you, you, you're making progress. Um, and then one, one time, I'm going to the book here, I got instantly worried when I stopped for lunch and saw I'd missed four calls from Alana. Usually she would just leave me a message, ask me to call her back. I worried that something had gone wrong with the funding for the challenge or worse still, that something was up with Molly or Tommy, your kids. I FaceTimed her, what's wrong, I asked. What do you wear to a royal wedding, Alana said. I had no idea what she was talking about. What do you mean? What do you wear to a royal wedding, she said again then lifted up a card so I could see it. Alana and I had been invited to Harry and Meghan's wedding. I didn't see that one coming, I told her honestly. Harry was a mate, but a royal wedding isn't for a few beers in the local. When is it? Alana smiled. She knew that I'd know the date date I was due to finish in Alaska off by heart. 19th of May, she said, and I heard myself groan. That was four days earlier than I was expected expecting to break the world record the last flight you can catch is on day 102 you better put your foot down (laughs) so you get the invite to go to the big wedding yeah so so the world record was 117 days and when i was doing my planning i thought you know there's there's certain contingencies but those things that are out of your control bit natural disasters coups and things like that so i thought if i encounter any of them on the challenge you know i don't want to eat into the challenge so my target was 110 days 
Um, and it's because we had that that fudge. Mm-hmm. So now, you give yourself seven days of fudge? Is I that g- right? I gave myself seven days of Got seven it. days of fudge. So it should be something out of our control. It wasn't eating into the record time. It was eating into that. I mean, I'd done all my planning on that. You know, I th- had a thing called the Bible. You know, I knew every inch of the road. We'd, we'd planned it out, had it on paper, had it on digital. We... Um, you know, South America, I did it in 48 days. The world record was 58 days. So I took 10 days off the first world record. And as you touched on there, you know, you had food poisoning, you had, you had everything else. But there was things that I didn't see as well. You know, when I was putting the plan together, you know, the medic I had to send home. You know, it's not in the book, you know, but I had to send the medic home on day 13 because it was bullying the documentary team. It's like, my God, the bike ride was actually easier than managing egos. Egos, you know, because they're pro bono, they all started wanting wanting more from the challenge as they saw it evolving. And thankfully, my wife was the campaign director. She was sort of managing, keeping control of that. We got to, I've, I talked about, you know, going from south to north. That was a great decision from a cycling perspective. I got a tailwind all the way through Peru. That's 2,500 kilometers tailwind. But every checkpoint, every border, we're having to swap vehicles. So that was slowing us down. So the plan was to have an RV and a 4x4 ship from Fort Lauderdale to, to Panama. So then when we did the second part of the challenge, that would take us all the way to Alaska. I was in Ecuador and my wife rang me and she said that the vehicles haven't gone onto the shipping container. She's like, oh, great. So thankfully my wife and my PA and two of my mates had foresight. They flew over to Fort Lauderdale and they drove the vehicles 4,000 miles in eight days. <laughs> my wife left the kids on Mother's Day back in the UK <laughs> and they drove it all the way to Panama. I broke the wheel record in the morning, flew across the Darien Gap and they just handed the keys over. You know, so they're an integral part of, the, of this challenge. You know, people see you on social media, but it's the team around you that they don't see. We then get to Mexico and the mechanic and the soft tissue therapist are like, ah, these are our new terms and conditions. I'm now... The project manager, we're going to change the name to this. I was like, oh, fuck, here we go. You know, and this has been going on for like nearly two months now. They said, you can't do this without us. I left them in Pueblo City. <laughs> hold my beer. Yeah, hold my beer. <laughs> my mate then drove the RV and then we, we just pushed on. We didn't have a mechanic, but we weren't far from the American border. So when I got to the American border, I got the American border on day 70 and I was 14 days ahead of the world record. I didn't realize how important it was getting to America. I don't know whether it was because everyone spoke our language. I wasn't on Google Translate for the last two and a half months. You know, the, the culinary options were better or probably because the previous record holders, all their issues were in South and Central. Have I left all that behind me when now it should be a smooth road? And also the fact that if there is any mechanical issues, we can just get another mechanic. You know, we can find a massage parlor. My, that was the hardest thing for my wife, trying to find a massage parlor, which is the right massage parlor. <laughs> um, so getting into America, I was at 14 days ahead, perfect. And then I had that phone call, yeah, which was great. But I was now going into that phone call was 14 days ahead. 10 minutes later, I'm now a day behind. So all that efforts I've done up until then, all that drama, has, not that it meant nothing. It's like, you've now got a new objective. Mm-hmm. So cycling in South America, because of the, the sport team and documentary team being risk averse, you know, I had to consider them. So I had to cycle from first light to last light and that was it and I was off the road. But getting into America, it's a lot more safer so I could cycle at night. And I got to Lubbock in Texas the next day and uh, 60 mile an hour winds and tornadoes. So I was grounded for another another uh, 24 hours. So I was now two days behind my new target. So again, I just looked at the plan, looked at the paperwork. And there's an app on your phone called Windy TV. It's quite popular with sailors and it gives you the strength and directions of the winds forecasted every hour for the next two weeks. It's about 95% accurate. It's 95% accurate? About 95%. Dang. It's a great, it's a great app. Yeah, and it was known as my second wife on this because I was just always looking at Windy TV. So for me to get out of Lubbock, I had to cycle 340 miles in 36 hours to miss the next weather window. And and that's what I did with North America. I just played chess with Mother Nature for, um, through North America. And the majority of the cycling was done at night because, you know, the winds. Oh, less just, wind. Yeah, less wind. Got to Cheyenne, picked up a 50 mile an hour tailwind. Uh, so covered 260 miles in 11 hours cycling. So I was also using it to my advantage. So I, I gained up that time. I had about 17 days originally on North America. I did it in 11 and a half and I thought, perfect. And then we got to a town called Whitehorse, about a week outside from the end. And I thought, you know, wheel record secure. I'm going to this wedding unless I get eaten by a grizzly. 
<laughs> and then this gentleman's, uh, this guy's come on on social media that day, professional cyclist. He's already got three other endurance wheel records, mid 20s, sponsored by all the big brands, Red Bull. And he's, he's announced that he's going to do the Pan American Highway in August be the first man to do it under 100 days. So I was like, great. <laughs> so every time I thought I, I had met my objective, you know, it, it then moved. But thankfully for me, if I'd known about that at the start of the challenge, if I'd known about the wedding, known about this guy, you know, I may not have pushed, I may have pushed myself too hard. Um, but thankfully for me, when I received that information, I was in a position mm -hmm. that I could act on it. So yeah, I cycled for, you know, the last two days, um, I had 250 miles to do. And it's Dalton's Highway. It's where they film ice truckers. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's that road there. And uh, I thought, well, I'll do 250, I'll do 150 miles today and 100 miles on the last day. And then I'm in. And my family of my wife, my kids are on, on, the, on this oil field in Prudhoe Bay at the end. So I know they're only a couple of days away. Did the first 50 miles and I got to this roadblock at noon. And the girl's like, no, you can't pass till eight o'clock tonight. So I was like, oh my God. So, so that evening I had to rest for eight hours and you're not resting. Um, and I just cycled from eight o'clock that night to seven o'clock the next night, 200 miles in minus 18 to make sure that I came in in 99 days and 12 hours. So I talk about the importance of planning, but actually the success of this was being reactive to the situation on the ground. You, you have a plan, that's great. You have a start point, you have an objective, but you know, if things change, as you know, it's best plan in the world to survive first contact. Um, and, and that's what it was, it's been, you know, reactive to that situation. And that, even to the very last day, I was having to change change the plan. So. Yeah, even, the, even when you talked about the fudge factor, which some people would have planned that and just had, oh, okay, I gotta be, do it in uh, two, 125 days yeah. or 123 days, cool. That's what yeah. they're gonna book. They don't understand all the things, that, the, the amount of room that it gives you to make those adaptations when you need to is, again, that's something we learn about. That things are not going to go smooth. That's <laughs> exactly. one thing I can promise you. Um, I'm gonna read one more thing out of the book here. Athletes talk a lot about visualization and how they had imagined their final moment of victory again and again and again. I'd done the same, but now that I drew close to the finish line, my moment was nothing like I had ever imagined it. This was no ride along the Champs d'Elysees with me leaning back in the seat with my hands in the air. I clung onto my handlebars for dear life, hitting one patch of black ice after another. My face was covered in frozen snot, my muscles were shaking from fatigue and cold, and every blast of Arctic wind cut through me to the bone. But I made it. And there you go, you skidded to the finish line. I pulled my wife and kids into a hug. I was so exhausted that I probably can't remember what I said. I was probably talking gibberish. But I'd missed them all so much and they got big kisses from their dad's cracked lips. Molly was aware of what was going on and full of beans, but Tommy was in a world of his own. I thought, it was, I thought I must be hallucinating when I saw the lady from Guinness was braving the cold in tights and a skirt, but there wasn't one ounce of discomfort on her face as she presented me with my record. I was now the record holder for the fastest cycle of the Pan American Highway, completing it in 99 days, which also made me the first person to ever do it in under 100. I hugged my wife, but unlike in Cartagena, this wasn't the place to stand around for a post-certificate photo shoot. Let's get to the hotel, I told my family and team as we piled into vehicles, leaving the frostbitten finish line behind us. <laughs> so you made it, and um, but that's not the end. That's not the end. Uh, it's not the end of the book, and it's definitely, definitely not the end of the path that you're on right now. Yeah. Because... Exactly. You needed a new mission, right? Yeah. <laughs> tell us, tell us what's up. What's your next challenge? Where are you where are you heading next? Yeah. So, my, so my USP is, uh, you know, I take a sport or discipline I've never done before and, and find the biggest chal uh, biggest challenge. So I've been arrogant towards the cycling community. It's now going to be the kayaking community. So the next challenge is to kayak the River Nile, the world's longest river from source to sea. So it's never been done before. Um, so unlike there, where I can speak to previous record holders, it's not been done before. So the plan was obviously to do it last year, and obviously COVID's you know put a scupper to that, and that's why I'm here in America. You know, <laughs> whilst the world is paused, let's get over here, get set up, and get ready for that. So yeah, four thousand two hundred eighty miles. But you know, unlike truckers and and support team, you got to worry. I've got crocodiles, hippos, civil war in South Sudan. But 
one thing I, I'm excited about this challenge, you know, I talk about, we talked about the successful private security missions. It, you know, everyone's quite quick to tarnish certain communities, you know, with one brush from what they see with, with TV. You know, if it wasn't for those local communities being so hospitable, I would never have been successful on them. And that's where the African Nile was going to be great. It's because it's, I'm going to have to rely on the locals to help me. And so, you know, it's not a world record. Whatever I do is, is the world record. Um, but one of the, so that's the next challenge. Um, but one of the big feedbacks from the book is, yes, great endurance feed, but you are the security guru. Why are you still not in this industry? So for me, I've I've got a niche security company, you know, very low key. Mm. We, we help either corporates, ultra high net worth, uh, and things like that because paddling and cycling doesn't put food on the table. As my <laughs> wife keeps reminding me. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so I've set a date first of February next year, um, and we set off on that. It's going to be huge. So you've got a team, you know, obviously that's doing the security work under your guidance. So what's the? How do people get in get in contact with you for that? type of business so we you know originally i wasn't going to have a website and things like that but uh, you know we, we will have a website that's password protected because for me the uh, my approach to security is you know there, there's certain ways of security uh, my, ours is more in, intelligence based you know you, you have the private element you know we then have the intelligence side of it and then and then the cyber you know we don't you know i don't normally walk around with tight black t-shirts with tattoos out you know <laughs> we, we blend in and things like that and it's just having that approach that i've used before um so yeah if you go to my website you can get in touch with them but the new website's getting built and that's what i've been doing this last four months is setting up the business preparing for denial and, and next and your website is um dean stott i was calling you dean scott i'm sure you've been called that a million times I, of times I was called you i was calling you dean stott or dean scott my wife was calling you dean scott so it's dean stott s-t-o-t-t dot com that's it is is where we can find you um also, you're on Facebook, Dean Stott SBS. You're on Instagram, which Echo only calls the gram, at, <laughs> at Dean Stott. Um, it's uh, real quick on the Nile. Hmm. What's the uh, what's like the major challenges there? What's the wor- what's the what's the hardest level rapids they have there? So Merchants and Falls uh, is the most powerful waterfall in the world. It's Grade Six. Grade six waterfalls. <laughs> but the problem you have with the waterfalls there is the, they, they take the, the crocodiles and the hippos from Lake Victoria and put them in Murchison. So when you come down, they're, they're all in the, in the pools at the bottom. So originally when we were going to do it for world record, they said, oh, you can only use one boat. That's just not going to be feasible. You know, 93% of the Nile is quite flat. So we'll use like almost like a ski mm-hmm. um, to go on that. But then you use a creek boat for grades three to four and then a raft. We'll have to use a raft on, on some of those big ones. Are you going to have like a sniper overwatch for <laughs> crocodiles and yeah. hippos and stuff? There's going to be a guy coming, a guy called Peter Meredith, actually. he's He watched his friend get et by a croc kayaking in the DRC, you know, so he knows the Nile inside out. You know, he's talking about throwing stones. I'm thinking use them for something a bit more powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, but local-wise, you know, I, I want to bring as many locals in as I can because – especially the fishermen, they know them waterways better than anyone. So if there's crocs and hippos in that pool, I'll just portage it. <laughs> I'll just, I'm not going to paddle through. I'll walk walk around it. Message-wise, you know, we one thing we, we're passionate about is modern slavery and human trafficking. And we're thinking of using this challenge to promote that. But then that sort of channels you into just, just one campaign. The great thing about the Nile is, you know, it's the lifeline of Africa. We can talk about poverty, pollution, mm-hmm. Uh, COVID, you know, so we, we're going to talk about there's so many, so many things along the, sh- the the challenge. Do you have a date plan to launch that? First of February, I set off. Yeah. Oh, dang. Next year. Yeah. Oh, okay. So one year, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Wait a second. I, you, you have to have a start point. I, I genuinely, you have to have a start yeah. point. If you don't have a, a start point, then the start, it just keeps moving. The start point becomes never. Yeah, it comes never. It keeps moving to the right. You have a start point, and then you can start approaching sponsors and start working back from that. So it gives me a year now to train at Newport Aquatic Center and, uh, you know, then look out, you know, get, get sponsorship. Um, the book is called Relentless. Uh, the, the subtitle is From SBS to World Record Breaker. Um, Echo, you got anything else? How's your leg from that? parachute yeah. situation yeah so when i actually started the the training i went to see a, a doctor and you know was testing the strength for my quads and my, my hamstring i mean it was it was him that identified your you know your leg is two kilos lighter that like, really um when i set off on the challenge i, I got the muscle 
mass back. Uh, my hamstring was 18% less power, but you know, it's, it's still good. No, we, we're good to go. So, does it bother you like day, day, like day to day kind of stuff? No, no, I, I, you know, my, I joke that my wife didn't marry me because I look like Lance Armstrong or Chris Froome. I try not go in Lycra as often as I can, but um, you know, for me, I need, and I, I still try and push it, push it on the bike now and then. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, the, um, I mean, it's awesome. It's awesome what you've done to support these charities as well. The, the heads together, and and I'm sure you're going to support some some awesome charities for this next event, Tattling the Nile. Hopefully, you won't support the charity of uh, free food for hippos and, <laughs> and Crocs. Uh. <laughs> but uh, the, yeah, people can get this book on the. Uh, we'll put a link for it on the website, and. Yeah, awesome. You got any final any, any final thoughts, Dean? No, I, th- I think you know when you see the website, you'll see the Frogman, and everyone's like, well, "Why the Frogman?" Because I always got the question: you know, "What's the difference between you and, and the other guys?" And going back to my original one, my reason for going SBS because I thought, you know, they're all divers, and they weren't. I ended up being the number one Frogman. So for me, I, I'm not I'm not a cyclist. I love I love the water. So we we have the Nile and then another one which Jocko, you're more than welcome to come along. It's called Surfing with Pirates, it's gonna surf the Somali coastline. Oh yeah, that's so, that'll be fun. That, yeah. That's not surfing with pirates, that's surfing with sharks. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But again, it's promoting these the, these countries and you know they're amazing countries as well. But obviously being as close to the water as I can. Yeah, I'm game. Uh, I never got a chance to go into Somalia. I sat off the coast of Somalia for months and months in the in the 90s waiting to go in. I never got the chance, so I, I didn't get to go operate. I'll go get some barrels. Let's let's rock yeah. and roll. Well, there's, there's there's breaks and beaches with no names, actually. So the plan is to you know from the north to the south. But, you know, again, people see what they see on TV and make their assumptions straight away. When I was in Mogadishu, again, I work on my own and work with the locals, and I was, like, spearfishing for lobsters and, and everything. And you, you wouldn't think you were in Mogadishu, but because it hasn't been commercially fished for years there's a huge mm. abundance of wildlife there as well yeah i think my wife anyone you, you you'll pick it up when you when you read the book you know it's, it's a team effort you know my transition from the military it wouldn't have been as smooth if it wasn't for my wife we're very much we know our strengths and weaknesses now my wife can't ride a bike you know i can but my wife is very good at all, all the planning I, I and she was key to the success of the challenge and the success of my time in the security i generally believe that anyone can break a will record if you take away all those distractions you know the business the mortgage you know who's looking after the kids and and that's what alana does does really well and yeah and, and then again my my young children have you no know, nine and four i i saw a joke that when my my son was, was two and a half the, the the challenge when we finished the challenge you know the challenge was older than my son. So I think he, he just thought I was a cyclist. Uh, and my daughter, she was born after I left the military. So when I tell her that, you know, dad was a soldier, she said, dad, you weren't a soldier. So my son thinks I'm a cyclist and my daughter thinks I'm a Walter me. Um, <laughs> so I sort of joke yeah, about that. But again, you know, they're very, they very much look up to mum and dad, you know, and they, and they travel everywhere with us. You know, they've been all over the world. They know Alaska, South America, you know, Australia and, and things like that. So very lucky to have that. I think people think once you have children, that's it. As you're traveling days over, you know, don't let them dictate, you know, your life. Well, awesome. Uh, thanks again for coming on and, and thank you for your service and, and Great Britain has always been our strongest ally and, and we as nations have been through hell and back together in multiple wars and we know we can count on you in our darkest hour so thanks for coming on sharing some of that with us and uh good luck thank you Pleasure. watch out for those hippos <laughs> and with that dean stott has left the building talking about his incredibly incredible journey pretty crazy stories um the the relentless pursuit of perfection yeah it's, he writes about that in the book mm-hmm. a lot. I, I only read it once today, but it's in there quite a few times. That mindset, the special, the British Special Forces mindset of the relentless pursuit of perfection. Awesome to have him on here. And thanks to Dean for coming on. And Echo, Charles. Yes, sir. Speaking of a relentless pursuit of perfection, mm-hmm. you have any suggestions that could maybe enable our Relentless pursuit of 
perfection. We're not going to get there, by the way. Uh, yeah. But we're going to pursue it. Yeah. I will say facilitate. Okay. I said enable. Enable and facilitate for sure. sure. Look, hey, look. With you. Are, are all of us trying to break Guinness world records for the book? We are not. Maybe, maybe Factual. not. No, factually, yeah. not everyone Not is. everyone, correct. So I think yes, factually, factually you can say that. But we're on a path, though. We're on our own path, right? And that path is not easy. That's why we're on it. In fact, if it's easy, is it even a path, really? Not really. No. I guess technically it's the path of least resistance. Yes, watch out for that one. That's a different kind of path. We know that it leads downhill, that path in particular. Yep, slippery. We're not looking for that path. We're not looking for it. We're not on it. We're not even, that's not our jam in any way. But the path that we are on is hard. Obstacles, pitfalls, and traps, mm. wise men once said. But on that path, you're going to endure or you have to endure some sort of pain in your joints. Depends on what you're doing, obviously. But Most people are going to endure that. Yes. Endure. Yeah. And look, I'm not saying you should worry about that. And in fact, if you really don't want to worry about that, guess what? Jocko has some supplements. How about that? For your joints. Okay. We got Jocko. You think there's anyone that's curious about how you're going to bring it all together well, I, at that well, moment? You know, people are like, oh, here it comes. You go, oh, there he did. He did it again. Hey, look, we're over here trying to sensationalize these things to make them sensational. Okay. Hopefully. I don't think there's anything sensational about it. Here's the deal. Yeah, you I don't, don't want to have joint issues. No. So you want to do things that take care of your joints. Yes. By joints, I mean shoulder. Elbow. Elbow. Yep. Knee. Neck. Whatever. Knees, yeah. You want to call it, if it's a joint in your body, you don't want it to give you issues. No. You don't want that. Nope. So that's why we made joint warfare. Mm -hmm. Go to war against that. Joint. That decay yeah. and krill oil, by the way, super krill oil. Yes, yeah. yeah. So now we don't even have to worry about that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of things you that you should be concerned about on this path: distraction, temptation, if you will, <laughs> your friends sometimes, and let's face it, your joints. You don't want to have to worry about that kind of stuff. Take the joint warfare mm -hmm. every day with the super krill oil every day, and you will not have to worry about that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's how it works. Get the subscription. Yeah, so check it out. We are trying to make things easier. So you can stay on the path more. So right now, everything at Jocko Fuel, if you subscribe to it, then the shipping is free. And look, we obviously, we, are, we understand that there's people that don't want to give their money to some giant companies, right? This is part of it. Mm -hmm. Also, so they don't want to give money to giant companies, but big, sometimes big giant companies ship stuff for free because they got this mass, you know, economies of scales and stuff. Right. We understand that. Mm -hmm. We understand that. So if you go to jockofuel.com and you subscribe to anything, we're going to ship it to you for free. You don't have to give your money to some big giant company. Mm -hmm. You don't have to uh, do that. It's fine. Mm -hmm. We're here. Jockofuel.com. Subscribe. Get joint warfare. Get super krill. Get discipline. Get vitamin D3. For your immune system, get cold war free. Any of these things, milk, multi flavors. Bro, I just had, <laughs> I just rotated milk. What'd you go into? Milk shakes. What'd you go from? Uh, the, the peanut butter one. Okay, but I no, I two? I rotated. No, not the flavors. I oh. rotated into a daily, or more oh, specifically, okay. a nightly. Got it. Probably put a banana in there. I think that's how from, yeah. from uh, uh, indefinitely. Yeah. That's just how right now right. get the kids on board. Mo, my kids are all about these different additives, you know? Yeah. I'm good. Oh yeah. Mo, cold day. Can you get a um, su subscription for the discipline cans? Yes, you can. Dang. Yeah. So yeah, yep, that's what we're doing. Yeah. So the discipline cans, that's for like us who, who kind of like are kind of down for the energy drink scenario, but are not down for the toxicity sugar. Mm hmm. And all these bad elements that most of the time come with energy drinks. That's what this is Well, they is do for. come with energy drinks unless you get these energy drinks. Exactly right. And that's exactly my point. So, yes, the so discipline go in you, a can. There's also powder. There's also pills. You so can also get some. this stuff. You can get the cans at Wawa. Yes. And you can get all the stuff at the vitamin shop as well. And also, if you are doing jujitsu, which is recommended. Yes. Look, this is, you want to talk about something you're never going to be, you're never going to achieve perfection in. Jiu-Jitsu is definitely one of them, yeah. but it's going to help you in a lot of different aspects. If you're going to do Jiu-Jitsu, go to OriginMain.com, get yourself a gi, get yourself a rash guard. And since you can't wear a gi or a rash guard, well, you can. John Donaher representing a rash guard in the supermarket. He doesn't care. All day. All day. All day. So, but are you going to wear on your legs? 
right? You Are you gonna wear ghee pants to the supermarket? Low probability. Low probability. How about you wear a pair of jeans? Cool, origin jeans, made in America. Origin sweatshirts, made in America. This is all origin. Yep. Beanies, whatever. Boots. All, all made in America. Boots. I hear some new stuff coming out with the boot scenario. I'm no, I'm in no position <laughs> to talk about it, but I hear good things from uh, you know Pete. Check. I follow him on Instagram. We're, we're, we're trying to make stuff happen. That's for sure. Uh, sure. OriginMain.com. All kinds of American-made products where we are bringing manufacturing back to America. Get some. It's true. Also, Jocko has a store. So JockoStore.com is where you can get discipline equals freedom stuff, shirts, hoodies, hats, like that kind of stuff. So we got discipline equals freedom. We got good. We got standby to get some. We got to get after it. Anyway, like I said, JockoStore.com. That's where um, if you see something cool on there that you want to represent while you're on this path, that's where you get it. 100%. We also have something formerly known as the T-shirt club. Whack. It's not really a club, I guess. It's just, it's a, it's a solid, kind of is a club, to be honest with you. But it's called the Shirt Locker. New shirt every month. Boom. By new, shirt. you don't mean like, oh, it's just a new shirt. It's a new design, new design. on the shirt. It's kind of, and okay, I'm going to use a word. I'm going to use it, exclusive. Because you can't get it on the store otherwise. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So you sign up for this, boom. So people that are like really into the game. In the game, on the path, <laughs> They're representing gonna hardcore. Yes, that's it. So yes, Jocko Store. <clears throat> com. Also subscribe to this podcast and um, you can do that wherever you get a podcast. We also have Jocko Unraveling, which which I can tell you Daryl's in the house. We're, we're, we're on it. I apologize. It's been a while. Daryl was wrapping up a bunch of stuff in his world and so now we're going to get back in the game there. Grounded podcast. We're Am I even making claims on that right now? I, I, no, we're, we're not making claims okay. yet, yet. Warrior Kid Podcast, I will make claims on. I owe that one. We'll get on it. Um, you can also join us at the Underground. Underground is where we're putting some alternative podcasts, maybe some amplifying information, some little behind the scenes. We're going to do a QA. and a You were just telling me about some Q&A where people yep. can send video questions. Yeah, audio or video audio questions. Audio or video questions. And you might be like actually featured um, like on it, like your voice. So, you know, clear your throat, mm-hmm. submit them, boom. Yeah, Work it. It'll be good. I'll, I'll make an announcement on where to send them. Yep. On what, like a Twitter, Instagram you scenario. Tell me what, something like that. You'll know. Yeah, you'll know. Um, and, and this is all from JockoUnderground.com. And look, it costs $8.18 a month. This is the platform that we control. So there's nobody that's going to tell us what to do. No sponsors are going to tell us what to do. No platform is going to tell us what to do. We're going to do what we want to do regardless. And it's $8.18 a month. And if you can't afford that, that's okay. We're not here to gouge. No. If you can't afford it, email assistance at Jocko underground.com and that's a, a little idea that I heard from Sam Harris Sam Harris same thing can't afford it cool he we're not I'm not trying to hold back information actually trying to keep information free-flowing because if something ever happens to these platforms we're gonna need something to, somewhere to go we'll have it yep. a little contingency plan is in action so appreciate the support over there it's true also we do have a YouTube channel for the video version of this podcast, we want to see what everybody looks like. You want to see what Dean looks like? Mm-hmm. Dean Stott, not Dean, Scott, no. by the way. If you want to see what Dean Stott looks like, if you want to see any of these, you can check it out. Oh, some excerpts on there. Yeah, and also I I do a lot, I do a lot of work as the assistant director Ooh. with a lot of these videos. So if you see something that you like, just let me know that you enjoyed my assistant directing. I feel like we all kind of enjoyed your. 10 list of 10 things that you utilize on a daily basis yeah, 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 or whatever. I think yeah. I think that was kind of a, a cool little hit that you guys kind of brought. You know, uh, I mentioned that my daughter kind of drove the the spirit behind that and people yeah. think I think people think think that that meant that she made it. Mm-hmm. She kind of did. She well, she did, but I mean, the editing. Oh, oh yeah. she get did she get director credit on that? I, I, yeah, she oh, does. Okay. Straight up. Right. Good job. Just stepping <laughs> it up. <laughs> um, yeah, I do a lot of assistant directing. Though. Yes, sir. I understand. Hey, also Origin USA has a little YouTube channel. You can check that out if you want to keep updated as to what it's like to grow a business. Yeah, that's a good one, man. Yeah, they put all kinds of cool stuff on their main tie. Yeah. Hell yeah. Pete. Yeah. 
<laughs> be little. They're up there getting after it. You know what it's kind of like? Like, you know, when you go to work, like, let's say you go to work every day and you kind of, let's say, I don't know, you're a manager. I don't know. Whatever. You go to work every day and you kind of get updated when you go in about, okay, what's currently going on? What's the status of this? What's the, it's kind of like that. When you, yeah. when you watch like the YouTube things yeah. or, or sorry, the, the, the origin YouTube channel, Origin HD. Yeah. That's the one, right? Origin HD. That's yeah. the one I watch all the time. Yeah. The, the interesting thing is like uh, if you watch a reality television show, yeah. what they do is they take a bunch of people with, with like weird personalities. Yeah. I'm not saying all cases, but this is kind of a stereotypical thing. Take a bunch of people and then they can fight with each other about whatever, right? right? Yeah. And so it creates drama for your TV show and then people watch it because they like to watch a train wreck. Yeah. The thing that's cool about, about what we're doing at Origin, when you see behind the scenes, it's not... It's not the team fighting with the team. Right. It's like, hey, how are we going to make this work? Yeah. You know, how are we going to get the right materials? How are we going to get yeah. this in production? How are we going to satisfy this this uh, clients that we've got or the customers? How are we going to take care of them? So it's that. It's that struggle. It's not a struggle against. There's no. There's no yeah. like uh, reality television drama. Yeah, the producer like, to, and this is what they do. By the way, from what I hear, it's not like I watch this kind of stuff. But I hear mm. that mm. they'll be like, hey, like there's little writers there oh, that'll yeah. be like, hey, look, we're going to send these people on a trip um, to the Bahamas. And hey, you like you got to you got to say that you don't want to go because of what this lady said <laughs> like last month on Instagram or something like this. And you better tell her yeah. and we'll just see how it plays out. Kind of a thing. See, and just like your point, though, how whack that is. Well, you know, I. At the end of the day, yeah, I, I agree. But it makes for good, cheap entertainment, mm -hmm. you know? But yeah, so you watch the origin one, and it's like, yeah, it's not scripted drama. It's like the actual drama that comes yeah. with running and maintaining growing like a business or yeah. whatever. So yeah, if you're interested in like how to run a business and what just the whole, that whole environment and the process and all that, oh man, it's really, it gets real interesting. Very interesting. <sighs> Check, so we got that. Also, we got an album called Psychological Warfare. It's me one. talking it's to you one. through your moments of weakness. We got FlipsideCanvas.com, which is Dakota Myers' company. Hang stuff on your wall that'll keep you on the path. Got some books. Obviously, Relentless, From SBS to World Record Breaker by Dean Stott. We have that up. We have it linked. Linked. Yeah. Books from the episodes books from on the, the episodes. website. Final Spin. A Story. Is it a poem? Don't know. Is it a novel? Don't know. I wrote it, but I don't know what to call it. If you want to try and categorize it, you're going to have a hard time. The 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 literary critics. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to have a field day with that one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how it shakes out for them. Leadership strategy and tactics, field manual. The code, the evaluation, the protocol, discipline equals freedom, field manual. Way of the warrior kid, four field manual. Way of the warrior kid, one, two, and three. Mike and the dragons, about face. My hack worth. I wrote the forward. Extreme ownership and the dichotomy of leadership. Also have a leadership consultant consultancy. It's called Echelon Front. Echelonfront.com. We solve problems through leadership. EF Online. If you want training for you, for your company, on leadership, if you want to get aligned, go to EFonline.com. We got the muster 2021. Go to extremeownership.com. If you want to come and if you want to come and get after it with us. You want to meet a bunch of people that are all moving forward on the leadership path. Everything we've done is sold out. These are going to sell out too. So come early if you want. EF Overwatch, if you need leadership inside your team in the civilian sector and you want someone from the military that understands the principles we talk about all the time, go to EFOverwatch.com. And if you want to help service members, active duty service members, retired service members, their families, Gold Star families, check out Mark Lee's mom. Mama Lee, she's got a charity organization, and if you want to donate or you want to get involved, go to americasmightywarriors.org. And if you want more of my, if you just, you're sitting there thinking, I could really use some more of Jocko's interminable reading, or you need more of Echo's unrelated revelations, you can find us on the interwebs, on Twitter, on Instagram, or for Echo the Gram. And on Facebook, Echo is at Echo Charles, and I am at Jocko Willink. And Dean Stott is at Dean Stott SBS on Facebook, and Dean Stott, S-T-O-T-T, -T, on the gram. And thanks to all military members around the world, and tonight especially to the United Kingdom.
And I know that we rebelled against you to form our own nation, but we became allies and we thank you for standing by our side on the battlefield. The little island with the heart of a lion. And to our police and law enforcement and firefighters and paramedics and EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, border patrol, secret service, and all first responders, thank you for your continued service and for being there for us when we call. And to everyone else, let me ask you this. What are you doing? What are you doing? Are you doing everything you can? Are you who you want to be? Are you who you are you who you are capable of being? Are you engaged in a relentless pursuit of excellence? And if you are, good. Then if you aren't, well then you just might want to pick a goal and go get after it. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko. Out.